A very good evening to all of you. We warmly welcome all of you to the inauguration ceremony of Second International Symposium on Geoinformatics, which is GeoSim 2022. As an integral component of GeoWeek 2022, we'll be uh, holding GeoSim 2022. So through this academic session, our prime expectation is to provide a profound scholarly platform for our young scholars to showcase their research and findings related to geoinformatics. With that in mind, now I would like to invite Mr. P.G.V. Aberatna, Dean, Faculty of Geomatics of Sabaragam University of Sri Lanka, to welcome the gathering. Good morning to you all. Vice Chancellor, Professor Uday Ratnayaka, Chief Guest of the Conference, and Professor Vasilis Gikas from National Technical University of Athens, our keynote speaker today, the conference chair, conference secretariat, and all uh, presenters who are going to present their uh, research findings today, academic staff, ladies and gentlemen. So on behalf of the Faculty of Geomatics, I warmly welcome you to the Geosim 2022 at Belly The Geosim 2022 is a biennial event comes under the event Geo Week 2022. The conference provides us with the opportunity to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the faculty. As the Dean of the Faculty, I'm privileged to issue this uh, talk here at the inauguration session of the Geosim 22 at this milestone. Over the last 25 years, <coughs> the faculty has made a tremendous contribution <coughs> excuse me, in research, teaching, and practice, resulting in a remarkable impact in many sec sectors, including academia, industry, and society as well. The conference would give researchers a platform to disseminate their findings through a carefully selected theme, Geoinformatics for Conquering New Frontiers Towards National Development. So we have experienced local and international in-person conferences till the global pandemic situation hit the academic and professional atmosphere. Nonetheless, it turned the day-to-day -day life upside down. We know it. This confinement paved the way to execute an extensive array of online conferences, educational webinars, and hybrid events uh, throughout the period. These hybrid events and tools are creating a new window for critical research to reach a larger audience, um, inspire inter uh, interactions, and more networking. We have an exciting program at this conference that will allow members to reflect upon and celebrate our past accomplishments, renew friendship, and extend our networks and jointly explore current and future research directions. I'm confident Geosim 2022 will play an important role in sp uh, spurring research, encouraging continuous program involvement, and providing excellent opportunities to build more and more better collaborations between colleagues. Thanks to all the members of the organizing committee of Geosim 2022, Thanks also again to our faculty members, the sponsors, the distinguished participants, and all who have contributed papers to the conference. The Book of Abstract will provide you later is a prelude for the conference proceedings. I wish you a very successful conference and an enjoyable hosting of 
the Faculty of Geomatics in connection with GeoSIM 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your thoughts. Now, I would like to cordially invite Professor R.M. U.S.K. Ratnayaka, Vice Chancellor of Sabrigam University of Sri Lanka, to address the audience as the chief guest of the event today. Very good morning, Professor Vasilis, the keynote speaker, Dean of the Faculty, Mr. Pula Beratna. Conference Chair, Dr. Indika, and the Head of Departments, Academic Staff Members, all other staff members and uh, dear students and other participants from different countries. Thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, very important event as the Chief Guest. I always believe that uh, Research are most, the most important thing for the development of a society. The Faculty of Geomatics during the last 25 years were contributing in their field of specialties by doing research, by uh, disseminating the research findings, disseminating the knowledge through this kind of research events as well as by developing the human resource requirement in the particular field required for the country as well as sometimes for the other countries as well. First of all, I would like to congratulate the faculty for the celebration of 25th anniversary. Uh, you have contributed to this university, this country as well as the world to the mankind in different aspects with your specialized field uh, tremendously during the last 25 years. Now you have come to a very important milestone and last year you started this uh, new concept. You initiated the, this uh, Geo Week uh, last year. This year also we are having this uh, Geo Week. It will continue and you have started this GeoSIM very important conference. I am sure that this conference would be a very uh, important as well as fruitful conference because we are having participants from Sri Lanka as well as from many countries. I, I could see that uh, there are many participants uh, are willing to uh, share their expertise uh, within this conference in the technical sessions to come. As well as I am very happy that we have a, a very well recognized uh, keynote speaker, Professor Vasilis. Uh, I am very much thankful on behalf of the uh, university for acceptance of our invitation to being a keynote speaker. And uh, finally, I wish all of you the very best to have a very fruitful conference. And I would like and engage with this very important conference. Wish you all the very best for faculty of geomatics for geoweeks as well as for this conference. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you very much, sir, for conveying your um, wishes to all our participants today. Now we are moving on to an important session, which is the keynote speech by Associate Professor in Geodesy, Professor Vasilis Gikas, at National Technical University of Athens. For this, 
I would like to invite Mr. Vipula Aberatna, Dean Faculty of Geomatics of Sabragam University of Sri Lanka, to introduce Professor Gikas for the session. Good morning to you all. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vasilis Gekas, uh, the keynote uh, uh, speaker for the Geosim 22 conference today. The Vice Chancellor, the Chief Guest, Professor Uday Ratnayaka, uh, Professor Vasilis Gekas, the uh, keynote speaker today, and Professor Wu Chen, from Hong Kong Polytechnic, uh, one of our plenary uh, session speakers. The participants, students, and ladies and gentlemen. So let me uh, introduce uh, Professor Vasilis Gikas in a very brief manner, uh, even though he has very long uh, uh, CV in, uh, written under his name. Uh, Vasilis Gikas is a professor at the National Technical University of Athens, Greece. He holds a diploma in serving engineering from NTUA and a PhD in geodesy from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, UK. His principal research interests are in geodesy and GNSS methods and multi-sensor systems for positioning and navigation, as well as dynamic monitoring and analysis of structures and physical process. He authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications in scientific journals and conferences. He is a member of the editorial board of scientific journals. He has served as a guest editor in four special issues in journals and has been uh, scientific responsible for the organization of the international scientific conferences and events. He has supervised more than 20 funded research projects and research expeditions. In the past, he worked for oil exploration industry in UK and USA as a positioning and navigation scientist and uh, after his PhD. He's so he, he he supervised in seismic acquisition and program in U Europe and West Africa uh, in special uh, geophysical uh, explorations. He's a member of several professional and scientific organizations. He's currently the co-chair of Commission for Positioning and Applications of FIG, of AIG, International Association of Geodesy, and Vice Chair of uh, Working Group 6.1, Deformation Measurement and Analysis of the uh, FIG, International Federations of Service. Apart from that, Professor Vasilis is the coordinator uh, of the LBS to ITS project, which is an Erasmus Plus project funded under uh, the European Union. So it's my pleasure uh, you to invite to deliver uh, your keynote speech at this uh, uh, GeoSIM 2022, uh, our conference at uh, under GeoWeek 22 at Faculty of Geomatics. This is over to you, Professor Gikas. Thank you. <coughs> dear Mr. Chancellor, dear Dean of the School of uh, Geomatics at Sabramagua University, dear organizers of the Geosim 2022, dear all. Uh, it is um, honestly my pleasure to be with you today, although it's really early in the place uh, I'm talking from. It's still just before six in Athens. And thank you so much for the kind invitation to deliver a keynote speech uh, to your conference. You know, I had already the chance to visit your uh, beautiful and hospitable country and the university in Belhuluva, the beginning this year. 
And uh, I have to say it was truly a really good experience. And I had a very productive time indeed there, meeting with uh, staff members, students uh, of your department and working uh, with you on a joint project we run together. And uh, I wish, I really wish <clears throat> that the uh, very tough days for Sri Lanka are behind. And I hope that uh, I will have the chance to visit and see you all again soon. So <clears throat> the topic of my speech today uh, tackles, um, I would think, uh, I would say, <clears throat> a very hot topic in geomatics uh, with impact on a wide range of applications. Uh, it actually addresses new technologies and um, all techniques used for new technologies for mobility applications with an emphasis paid uh, on the needs, the challenges and the potential of um, such technologies for the future. So let me share my screen with you. And just please verify that you can see my presentation clearly. Yes, we do. Excellent. So, yeah, uh, multi-sensing uh, technologies for seamless positioning. Needs, challenges, and uh, research activities. Um, Actually, I would split uh, my presentation into uh, four sections. We start uh, about the localization problem itself and the PNT, how we call it position, navigation, and time triplet. And we focus on applications and user requirements. Applications, user requirements is the driving force of how we can make best of our technology solutions. Then we make a shift in GNSS, it's widespread. How we can go, how far we can go with the GNSS for such problems. We pay attention on alternatives and backups to GNSS, other sensor technologies. And of course, we need to talk about localization techniques based on um, <coughs> sensor technologies uh, characteristics. And we actually uh, uh, conclude with uh, collaborative positioning technologies and techniques, which is, um, I would say, uh, the trend and the potential on the topic for the future. And before I say uh, good morning to you, a few uh, points on how we actually, the best way that we can make use of this in, in, in education. So, uh, excuse me, Professor Vasilis, if you, yes, excellent. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, okay. The localization problem in geomatics. So, the localization problem in geomatics, it naturally relates closely to the transport, transportation problem itself. And talking about transportation, transportation and mobility, in broad terms, it relates to the mostly to the movement of goods, persons from one place to another, and the various means by which such a movement is accomplished. We have many different means of transportation available uh, on land, uh, in the sea, in the air. But how, how the uh, localization problem links to the transportation problem itself? Transportation and mobility um, deals actually with three basic questions regarding uh, geolocation. The first one is, where am I? That is position. How do I get there? Given the position, I need to know or to find a way, my way to the uh, a place uh, I would like to go. And third, at what time? We talk about kinematic positioning, we talk about navigation, time is really important. So we talk about 
those three elements, position, navigation, and time, globally known as PNT, which is what, let's say, we call the uh, state, what is of actual interest in uh, uh, mobility problems related to the actual process of movement along a trajectory towards a final uh, target. And to approach this problem from a geomatics point of view, we deal with sensors from which we get observables of various kinds and mixed together through computations leading to what it is called PNT. And uh, just to make crystal clear, be before we move into uh, solutions, <clears throat> that it is very important to realize the mechanism of how these three elements interact each other. The basis of the PNT pyramid is time. Time measurement forms the basis, the fundamental information for position computation, and by extension, the position state acts as a prerequisite for navigation. Therefore, therefore, to navigate an object, a vehicle from one place to another, originally we rely on time measurements. And that's important to note the available technologies and sensors related to time measurements also in addition to other types of measurements. So how do we treat, let's say, sensor technology for PNT in geomatics and geodesy? One way, one perspective to, <clears throat> to talk about this problem, it might be the um, IAG perspective, the perspective from the International Association of Geodesy. And I start with this because of the very <coughs> close relationship links I have with this society myself. So what we do in IAG regarding sensor technologies and PNT? The goal is we intend to bring together scientists, researchers, professionals, dealing with what we call emerging positioning techniques and technologies, aiming to address practical but theoretical solutions for positioning, navigation and guidance, including special temporal monitoring and tracking of objects at various scales. So in practice and in short, that means to provide continuous, robust positioning, navigation and timing solutions to serve a wide range of applications ranging from the transportation and personal mobility through the industrial and environmental sector. So if you examine this plot right here um, on, the, um, on the bottom, we generally deal with kinematic phenomena that their resolution in time and position accuracy ranges, let's say, from sub-second to seconds in time and from sub-centimeters to some tens of meters rep respectively. So we lie somewhere here. This is applied geodesy uh, cases <laughs> as opposed to precision geodesy or the fundamental geodesy, what we know uh, dealing with uh, really ultra-high accuracy applications of a static manner. So in this case, in our problem, we deal with, uh, let's say, lesser uh, requirements regarding accuracy, but with positioning dealing in kinematic applications. So what about um, user requirements. The slide here, it shows a list of emerging application examples that rely on PNT information. As you can see, we dealt with a quite long list, starting from location-based services and personal navigation to navigation and guidance of robots and precision farming. However, what about user requirements for such applications? This is really important as user requirements shape and scale out solution approaches and their success. So, 
let's concentrate on this um, on this plot. User requirements could be listed in many ways, such as in a fish plot shown here, from <clears throat> which four basic categories are recognized. Positioning, interference, cost, security, and legal requirements. What is the most relevant and critical category for uh, us as a geomatic engineers? Primarily, positioning requirements, although all other requirements are still of importance for us because they all work together in a way as a whole. But talking about positioning requirements, uh, we should um, somehow clarify that we all as surveyors brought up talking about accuracy on a solution. This is very true. We still need this here. But as we talk about kinematic phenomena, we need to take care about the sampling rate, the update rate of the sensor we use, what is the latency of the measurements, and what is the continuity of the solution. And um, by the end of the day, talking about safety critical applications, we need to care together with accuracy about integrity, how we rely, how much we rely on the solution provided by a system. So as you can see, the whole thing is complicated in a way, and we need to take care of several parameters before we go ahead, deliver a position solution, a PNT solution, and uh, verify that this solution meets our needs. And in effect, the PNT solution, the position navigation and timing solution, relies on what we call the PNT quality pyramid on the environment, how the environment affects the solution, outdoors, indoors, hybrid. What about the position engine, meaning what about the sensor type, the grade and positioning technique used, the mapping scale, the level of detail of the solution, and of course, these days, <clears throat> it's really important the infrastructure and what we call connectivity. Because we talk about uh, networks of sensors providing a solution either to a single point, single user, or a network of users. <clears throat> so, one I would say that let's go with GNSS. GNSS would provide a solution. We have more than 100 satellites up there. They work in an interoperable way. We have multiple frequencies to deal with the atmosphere and other artifacts. We have specialized services, such as the search and uh, uh, the search and rescue service in Galileo to start at the beginning of next year. Um, why not go with that? And uh, if we have a look also at the uh, uh, GNSS market today, look at this table, look at the, the various types of application areas we have, and look at the total revenue expected the GNSS uh, to share in the next um, uh, seven to eight years. And of course, from this one, we actually um, concentrate that the massive application areas is the transportation application areas and the personal mobility. Look what happens to other means, to other application areas from which what we actually do as surveyors is the only 2.4 of the total. So yes, this is a mass market application area uh, about PNT information, and we need to concentrate on this. And GNSS, it actually plays a very important role to this, but at the same time, we need to think how far we can go with this, given the environmental conditions and given um, the, uh, the actual parameters we need to, to compute. So to, 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 to tackle the problem in more detail, we prepared just this table here, in which what you can see, it's, it's actually the market segments, right in this second row and 
at the bottom, it's uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the third row, it's what we can do with GNSS as absolute positioning itself, and what we can do with GNSS with what we called uh, SBAS corrections, meaning corrections we get from some other type of satellites to uh, help to improve the absolute positioning we get directly from the GNSS system itself. So going from left to right and going, let's say, from mass market consumer applications <coughs> to liability critical applications, safety critical applications, high precision applications, uh, you see that depending on the application type, we're interested on different parameters related to positioning. Those quality metrics mentioned in the slide before. So we need to care about the availability. We need to take care about the accuracy, the time to first fix, authentication issues, very important these days, and continuity, so on and so forth. But as we talk about continuity and we talk about availability, we also need to think about the environment. The environment, meaning what? Mass market applications uh, are actually needed mostly for urban environments. But what happens at urban environments? You see situations like this. If we talk um, in uh, urban um, areas with high buildings, um, or what about indoors? No signal or very weak signal, really bad solution. So GNSS alone, it has a great potential. It can give you a really good uh, solution in uh, rural or suburban areas. You can still get a good solution uh, in cities, but there are there is no way that you can guarantee continuity or availability up to the level required, especially going from um, mass market leisure applications to safety critical applications. And um, let's 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 take um, um, a few seconds to go through how much we can do with GNSS, especially with low cost systems, because this is an important thing. Low cost systems, starting from uh, the old times, going today to the smartphones. What you see here, it's um, some example results from an experiment took place uh, in our campus just a couple of years uh, ago, before the beginning of the pandemic. So what we actually do here, we placed on a car uh, a couple of uh, really uh, contemporary smartphones along with a high accuracy system, high integrity system, a GNSS INS system, and we computed what we call the uh, accuracy, that is the repeatability of the solution, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, trueness, how far the uh, solution we get, it's from the true uh, trajectory. So we moved along this direction here, which is rural or suburban, going through deep urban here and out here in um, good visibility conditions path roads. And what you get here, in very, very brief, what you can see is that uh, the trueness values for this unit, the HTC, it's the blue dots, they are out of the uh, zone of the uh, precision band that the uh, smartphone is giving you. So you, you, you consider that you are always within this area here in between the, in be, in between the two red lines, but in fact, you are well out of it. Uh, what about... Um, if, if, if this is the a long track solution, this is the a cross track solution. So that actually means we cannot trust this solution for most of the trajectory, especially in the urban environment. As we get solutions up to uh, 20 meters uh, accuracy or even more, um, and the system you have a hand it's telling you that we are below five meters. So this is a heavily obscured area and this is an open area. Um, to deal with the problem, 
what we actually do, we have to employ different types of sensors. So as we move from GNSS to other type of sensors, we talk about radio frequency systems, it's UWB, Wi-Fi these days, Bluetooth, RFID, and other types of sensors working on a completely different principle of operation, such as inertial systems, optical systems, other systems. And the key idea here is how to match different types of systems to get a blended solution of um, uh, optimal accuracy. So when we combine GNSS to inertia, the, short, the, the, the low short-term accuracy of GNSS matches really well with the high short-term accuracy of accelerometer and the low sampling rate of GNSS with the sampling rate of inertial systems. And working this way, we can go through or mention many different types of technologies, as I said before, ranging from optical and magnetic systems at really high accuracy, but very small, very narrow coverage going outside through, uh, let's say, inertial navigation systems that they operate, and they have really good accuracy, short term though, um, at long distances, at very long distances, but low accuracies. So the idea is how we combine those together to get the best possible solution. Another way to see this, it's like what you see in this uh, slide here, um, in, in, in which case we compare the expected accuracy and the availability. So you see the opposite right here, that GNSS and cellular technologies, they expect to have much better accuracies with the GNSS um, and not really good accuracy with the cellular systems. And considering those solutions right here, such as the pseudo lights, RFIDs, and Wi-Fi, no, re not really good accuracy yet. But what's the benefit out here? The amount of new infrastructure needed. So working with Wi-Fi, you cannot go that far, but it doesn't cost, which means uh, what is the best way that we can make use of this kind of information because it is available as a backup to other technologies that uh, and they can get a better solution at a high cost, though. So the idea is uh, to, to tackle this problem overly, to, to, uh, to go through how, how PNT solutions evolve through time in a way. So we started from what we call it a single sensor, single platform solutions to multi-sensor single platform solutions. And today uh, we talk about multi-sensor, multiple multi-platform solutions. Those, uh, these kind of solutions, the single sensor, single platform ones, uh, a typical example is what we call the differential GPS. Um, nowadays, single sensor, single platform solutions are very uh, are of very interest, and, and it's a hot topic for PNT research when we talk about how we use Wi-Fi or the new protocols of Wi-Fi, ranging Wi-Fi, ultra Wi-Fi, RFID based on the same principles used to develop solutions, well-known solutions such as the uh, differential GPS. So talking about single sensor, single platform solutions for the case, let's say, of Wi-Fi, we, um, uh, we, we apply the same type of principle here, in which case, let's say that we have three access points in order to locate the user right here, we need to get ranges from those access points to the user. And the user is a, um, a smartphone user in our situation. So how to measure using Wi-Fi the ranges from uh, the access points to the user? We actually measure in the classical Wi-Fi protocol, IEEE protocols, we measure um, signal strength. But how singular strength relates to range? And this is a tough question because look here in this diagram for measurements we did uh, in the past three, four years, how the 
signal strength relates to distance to range indoors and how it relates to a corridor um, environment. So we need somehow to model those uh, RSS measurements to distance to go through them two ranges in order to obtain a position. And this is very tough because the ambiguity of those of this kind of uh, transformation is really high. So to, to cope with this kind of problems, we developed um, us and other groups worldwide, many people working on this, um, different solutions like the one you see here on the slide. So we talk about the DGPS principle or the VLBI principle, what we well know from, from um, uh, fundamental geodesy. We actually uh, take these kind of principles and we make use of them in um, our problem, considering reference stations the same way as we do in GPS and VLBI. And based on those uh, reference stations, we compute corrections. And those corrections are used for uh, positioning. So in this case, let's say you have those three access points and you have the user here and the four access points. And then you have a reference station. This could be in various locations. And this is a, a dynamically moving reference station based on the DGPS principle or the VLBI principles. We compute corrections to uh, get down to uh, a user PMT. Um, this could uh, take the form of single or multiple reference stations and um, uh, we actually pro produce an application that uh, it's making use of these uh, principles to, uh, to, to, to implement uh, this kind of algorithm. What you see here is some very uh, first results, some results from uh, an experiment that took place um, together with uh, TUV. Uh, in uh, Athens. So this is um, a corridor. This is um, a, a lab uh, room, um, indoors, of course, with Wi-Fi routers, the Raspberry PIs acting as reference stations or access points, depending on the scenario. Um, and we have ultra wide bands for uh, computing the uh, reference trajectory. And we have what we call it intelligent checkpoints check to, to, uh, to update the solution. So what, what you get here is considering that the ground truth is what you see along these lines. Uh, it's how how get we can get closer to the to the to the uh, ground truth, um, making use of um, uh, those uh, DGPS principle applied to Wi-Fi as opposed to the line in purple, which is uh, the simple Wi-Fi solution for this case. Uh, more examples, um, just go in very, very brief. These days, it's really important to talk about Wi-Fi RTT as we talk about Wi-Fi, round trip time systems, protocols that they provide you the range itself and not the RSS simply as we did in, in the past. So uh, how such systems would perform? Currently, we have a project uh, on... Um, uh, acquiry. So we need uh, a localization solution in very tough conditions, indoor conditions, um, working environment, dust, multipath, um, many different problems. But we do have Wi-Fi available in there throughout the area. So what we, what we, um, our goal is here is to provide a unified solution based on Wi-Fi RTT aided with other systems such as uh, ultra wideband. And because Wi-Fi RTT is really new, at this stage we perform some preliminary testing um, within our university, making use of um, uh, anchor points and users. And we combine this Wi-Fi system with uh, other systems widespread in such an environment like LoRa. Uh, or uh, UWB, as I said before, and uh, we produce different kinds of trajectories based on, on different assumptions, different scenarios. Um, it's The results we get are really positive, uh, as uh, Wi-Fi RTT performs much better compared to uh, uh, 
uh, Wi-Fi systems, uh, the original Wi-Fi systems, we have a long way to go ahead. And let's move now to the second case, in which case we talk about multi-sensor signal platform. Numerous applications here as well. Mobile mapping systems, maybe it's the most uh, well known that we have one platform, many sensors moving all together. And what about mobile mapping systems? We actually using them to map the surroundings. And what you see here, it's um, systems coming from the past. This is the mobile mapping system of uh, our laboratory that goes back over 10 years. Land, rail, and uh, uh, personal mobility systems testing at that time. Um, the thing is that uh, um, as we move along in time, um, we move from road inventory and asset management topics, uh, road mapping and highway uh, facility management and, and, so, and so on, to modern applications related to smart cities, to condition assessments, audits, military, emergency response, as we move, go down here to modern applications, let's say, user requirements change. And uh, as technology changes over time, we can meet those needs better, easier, but it's really hard that we provide as a scientists and researchers, university people, the solution itself, so the expansion of mobile mapping systems related to the single platform multi-sensor concept evolves from the 1970 using the photo logging systems at the uh, bottom left here to perpassive and ubiquitous systems today <coughs> that make use of uh, new technologies, uh, low cost technologies, um, Still, the university people have uh, different problems to tackle. What you see here is a single platform, multi-sensor multi case. And this is the result from uh, a PhD study, which just completed. The problem here was to tackle what we call performance monitoring in competitive rowing. It is really important that you know the PNT of the boat and the PNT of the athlete as it runs along um, the run. So we actually set up a system on the boats, on the blades, and the athlete, GNSS, INS, uh, many different other type of sensors. Uh, we collect raw data collection, raw data information, Processing and analysis is based on um, analytical and also um, machine learning techniques here because of the really nice uh, repetition of the type of motion. So you compute the variation of all parameters related to the problem, applying the techniques used in the uh, uh, in this type of um, athlete uh, uh, um, activity. And the goal here is to reduce the runtime through improving the athlete technique. This is a typical single platform multi-sensor uh, case, um, uh, but in a specialized manner. And finally, we go down to what we call today multi-sensor, multi-platform case. This is a network approach which brings us to what we call cooperative navigation or collaborative navigation, collaborative position. <laughs> what, it, what is it about? It's an integrated positioning solution, termed collaborative or cooperative, in which we employ multiple location sensors with different accuracy on different platforms, having the ability of sharing information so that we get the best possible solution of the complete network of nodes. And the main goal in such a situation is to get 
a robust and ubiquitous PMT for the complete network, seamless transition between different environments using different sensors. In that case, let's say you have a user that has no good availability to satellites. This user can get assistance, help from other users in the vicinity through ranges that they have good availability to the satellites, meaning better PNT. So the whole system is uh, aims to an optimal estimation of the platform positions and <laughs> using sensor fusion of all currently available measurements. Um, many different applications, um, as the ones you see on the slide, and many different sensor of augmentations of GNSS, IMUs, accelerometers, magnetometers, odometers, compass, gyroscope, different principle of operations, um, really tough problem in generality to deal, uh, but very interesting indeed. So let's see some, some example, some example before we go closer to, to, to the end of a joint IAG FID activity uh, we had through the multi-sensors working group just before the pandemic escaped. What you see here is some sort of experiment of what we call smart intersection simulation. So we placed um, at the by the corners of this intersection ultra wide band systems. We expect that those would be available at some point um, for, uh, uh, for for the for the general case, and we have vehicles moving on predefined trajectories, and <clears throat> and the, the the idea here is to uh, let's say fuse those different type of measurements to obtain the best possible solution, um, or based on the CP principle, the collaborative positioning principle discussed before. And this also includes not just vehicles, but also pedestrians. Pedestrians that, at that case, in order to get a solution, let's say we employed this sort of helmets. Of course, this is not what would like to look like in reality, but we had to put all, all stuff together uh, for, 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 for the experiment. So we have uh, vehicles and we have pedestrians employing different kinematics and we need to take care uh, to accommodate actually all this in, in a, a single model to produce the best possible PND of the network. Uh, some other uh, activity related to uh, uh, collaborative positioning. Uh, it's a project that we run locally uh, here in Athens with uh, the University of Helsinki and the Politecnico di Torino, and it all about um, um, it's 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 similar to the to the problem uh, mentioned before. Uh, how we can actually uh, compute the location of a user, a vehicle user, in a deep environment using GNSS only. That is to say, uh, what is the best we can do with GNSS in really tough environments? as a component to the total solution. And here we employ different uh, uh, GNSS techniques based on the moving-based idea, moving-based uh, uh, positioning idea, um, um, relying on sharing information among user corrections, let's say, from users with a better localization uh, information to the user uh, of interest. Um, uh, this is the um, <coughs> GNSS, the sorry, the sensor platform developed at uh, the uh, within our uh, laboratory to accommodate different type of sensors, GNSS high grade sensors, uh, smartphones, uh, ultra wide band sensors, lidar sensors, and so on and so forth, used only for testing purposes for uh, research. So this is a brand new, that's why I put it here. Just a few weeks ago, we've done some testing um, around the university campus um, in a suburban environment here. 
urban environment going into town and deep urban right here. Um, still no results, but um, um, hopefully in the next, uh, in the coming weeks, we have some uh, outcome of this. This kind of, uh, uh, let's say, research activity, it, um, it, 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 it relates to uh, research students, but also uh, except uh, uh, postgraduate and PhD students, we, uh, we make our best that we uh, get this knowledge down to uh, education, starting even from the uh, undergraduate programs at the very, very basics, so people, students get the culture behind, <laughs> behind these concepts and they get ready um, if some of them decide to, uh, <clears throat> to move on uh, research. So you get a, bit, a, to get a good idea of what it is all about and to prepare people getting into this. Uh, so coming into education and before I close this uh, 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 presentation, um, I, I, I feel this is really important that I make a note on the joint project we have with uh, uh, you in Sri Lanka. Um, this is education related, but education related to uh, when, we, when we talk about LBS and ITS, location-based services, intelligent transportation systems, behind those two elements we see PNT. From our perspective, we see PNT. And uh, because we uh, work together with uh, transportation specialists, from, from you guys and also from, from, from us in Europe. And uh, IT specialists, we see the whole thing as a whole. And this is actually a great, a great experience, um, considering that uh, the key objective of the problem, of the, of the, of the project, uh, if, if, if you look closely into this, uh, you see PNT behind its every single line. Uh, PNT is not the final product, and we do realize this, not for this case only, but generally. PNT is a service. It's a service that if you don't get this service, you cannot get down to the final result. What the transportation, the IT engineers requires, or the uh, whatever the case is. So uh, we do consider that our specialty and we do consider that uh, what we uh, can produce, it is, um, it is really important. And I'm really happy uh, that uh, I had the chance to work with, with you uh, in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And I hope, let me take the chance to say so, I hope that in the coming months, the situation is it's, it's better. Uh, considering the pandemic and considering all other really well-known problems. And um, I hope that I see you again soon, physically, hopefully with some of uh, our people from, from the department in the upcoming train the trainers courses um, in the mid of next year. Um, we, it, 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 it tends to finalize it soon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Geekas, for sharing this valuable session with all of us. Uh, now it's time for any of you. If you have any questions, you can ask from Professor. Yeah, good morning. Uh, shall I ask uh, something? Please. Am I audible? OK. Uh, Professor, it's a very interesting uh, presentation. So I'm just uh, curious to know that how you do you prioritize these multi-positioning uh, systems when you enter from one environment to another environment? Like say, you'll be working with uh, GNSS plus IMU and some indoor positioning. So once you're coming from outdoor environment to indoor environment, how do you prioritize and what is the, uh, the computation or artificially how you do the system, you know, change from one priority to the second one based on the uh, environmental conditions or the positioning accuracy levels. So it does it, you know, uh, 
automatically identify the queue by doing some QA QC and how it works? I mean, I just curious to know. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you for the question. I think this is an open question anyway. It's not, a, it's not an easy answer here. It's not a, a generalized answer, I would say. There are many different ways that one tackle the problem. Um, uh, one way, of course, is to give uh, different uh, weights, let's say, to different environments and to different um, sensor types, sensor information type, and um, considering historical data, meaning um, observations coming from the past to the near past, actually, uh, at, 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 at the current time, to, um, to, 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 to make the best of this information so you can get the best possible solution. And uh, on the top of this, um, the trend these days is to compute the integrity of the solution. The integrity of the solution uh, it relates to the robustness of the solution. And there are many different approaches how to compute the integrity of a positioning solution in addition to the accuracy of the solution. This is based on um, uh, statistical properties of the solution um, uh, through threshold values, and uh, you, you 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 accept for the for the final for the final solution, similar to what we call what we use uh, the rhyme technique um, uh, for for aviation. That in that case. We, Accuracy is one aspect, integrity is the other aspect. But integrity, it's not easy to compute on land. It's not as easy as uh, on air. Um, so it's an open, it's an open question. Still. Hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, Good morning. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your very informative and interesting presentation. I got a small question. I'm very interested about your the sensors, a lot of sensors wearing in your head and uh, doing some uh, uh, testing there. So how do you deal with uh, the signal interference? Because when it comes to the GNSS positioning, the signals, uh, it plays a significant role when you have multi sensors and create a lot of electronics and generate a lot of signals uh, it may interfere with your original gnss signals how you deal with uh, such scenario <laughs> again this is this is still an open question because it's it's, it's not easy to deal with this kind of artifacts in general um, okay considering different type of sensors let's say GNSS, um, uh, uh, interference relates mostly to RF systems. Okay, so considering that you have um, other types of systems in, in your solution, such as uh, inertial or optical, then you can uh, rely on these kind of sensors providing different weight to those measurements considering the uh, RF measurements. And also, considering RF measurements themselves, the different type of technologies, RF technologies, they're affected in a different way, in a different manner from interference. So GNSS is affected from different source interference sources compared to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Wi-Fi interference. So as long as you employ different sensor technologies, um, then you have the possibility to assign, let's say, in a dynamic manner, different weights to those measurements to cope with the problem itself. But again, this kind of problem, it's not easy to solve. We know much more about GNSS interference um, compared, let's say, to Wi-Fi RTT. Uh, interference problems because this is this kind of protocol is it's really new we are still at the stage of characterizing the uh, quality of Wi-Fi RTT ranging uh, so the solution is to an approach the solution would be to understand the nature of those interference sources and how they react to their own uh, data of each of the technologies 
And as long as you characterize those, there are different ways to tackle the problem, starting from putting different weights, different type of uh, uh, sensor measurements, or even uh, applying uh, uh, new techniques based on uh, historical data using uh, AI uh, uh, techniques and, and so on. Yep, thank you very much. Yep, uh, Professor Wu, do you have anything to clarify? Yeah, Professor Wu, uh, do you have anything? No. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. Yes, uh, Professor Vasilis, I'm very Um now Good morning. Uh, yeah, good, good morning. Very good morning. Um, now, uh, as uh, someone said, now you are working with uh, different, I mean, the number of sensors. And uh, solutions are, of course, uh, want to take, you know, dynamically while everything is moving. So then uh, classical computations of, I mean, the getting all these uh, positions and all by using least squares and everything would take little time with iterative solutions and all. So ha have you developed any direct solutions kind of stuff or some different algorithms in order to get rid of this computation problem or may sometimes, you know, with singularities? So how do you reg regularize all these things uh, during the, um, the process? Okay, this is um, another tough issue, and there are different approaches to to tackle this kind of uh, problem based on the architecture that you adopt for uh, for your solution. Uh, architecture architectures could be centralized or decentralized. You can get a network solution, or you can get a solution um, on a single user basis. And of course, that brings us from what we traditionally know as uh, processing techniques and analysis techniques of the data uh, to um, the mode you treat the information. And the way we treat the information, we need to uh, get advice or actual help from other colleagues uh, especially electrical engineering colleagues, that uh, they, uh, they assign with their role to make the best possible use of flowing information among the network nodes. The flow of information, the flow of data. So there are centralized, decentralized techniques, and there are also um, other techniques, what, what they call it edge computing, or computing at the edge, meaning um, uh, using the best possible um, combination uh, of um, uh, network capacity of uh, processing data that some task is undertaken locally or globally or by uh, a user uh, standing uh, nearby, depending on the ability of each user. But that brings out us, bring out of what we traditionally know as processing of the data uh, on the user or on a single user itself. The, the whole situation, it's, it's more complicated these days. And this is a separate issue itself. Uh, the solution of weeks, of, 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 of weeks, um, the geomatic engineering cannot go alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for all the clarifications. So with that, we have now come to the verge of the inauguration ceremony of GeoSIM 2022. And now, I would like to invite Dr. Chemai Prasanna, Conference Chair, Second International Symposium on Geoinformatics, GeoSIM 2022, Senior Lecturer of the Department of Serving and Geodesy, Faculty of Geomatics, to indicate the concluding remarks of the event.
Okay, uh, good morning to you all. Vice Chancellor, Professor Udhir Ratnayaka, uh, Professor Gikas, uh, our keynote speaker today, and uh, Professor Vuchen, uh, one of the plenary speakers today, and distinguished uh, participants, uh, Dean of the Faculty, Sri Pula Ratna, and Head of the Department, and members of the academic staff of the faculty. Uh, as a chair of the uh, second international symposium on uh, geoinformatics, uh, Geosim uh, 2020, I'm very much uh, happy to be the part of this year's symposium. We organized in parallel with the Geo Week uh, activities uh, 2022. Actually, we started this uh, event in 2019 uh, with the view of uh, providing a platform to all the final year students uh, to uh, celebrate their research uh, achievements. Uh, today, this uh, event uh, has become a major academic event uh, conducted by the faculty uh, to exchange uh, uh, and share experiences and research findings among our research scholars, uh, academic staff, and students from the faculty. So I'm happy to announce that uh, we got more international participations uh, this year through preliminary uh, talks by eminent uh, researchers and presentations by uh, research scholars. Today is the inauguration uh, session of this symposium, and I would like to thank the distinguished invitees who have participated to grace this occasion and express their thoughts and wishes uh, to the symposium. First, uh, I would like to thank uh, chief guest of this event today, Professor uh, uh, Udhir Atnayaka, Vice Chancellor, Sabrakam Institute of Sri Lanka. So thank you very much, sir, for attending this uh, opening session and uh, express your thoughts and ad wishes to the symposium. So we are giving a tremendous support to the academic activities of the faculty, and we are anticipating that in future as well. So next, I would like to thank uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Vasilis Gikas from National Technical University of Athens. Uh, your wonderful and very informative talk uh, well inspired us and also young researchers and uh, faculty and students who are joining this event uh, online through various channels. So we have uh, been involving uh, faculty academic activities quite heavily since recent past. And thank you very much for all your commitments and dedications towards the enhancement of faculty academic activities and your time today for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Also, I would like to thank uh, 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 and welcome uh, Professor uh, Wu Chen. Uh, he's one of uh, my, uh, my supervisors of my PhD studies uh, from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And it's an honor to you know see your participation, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear from you, you know, from you today. Thank you very much, sir. And also, I would like to thank uh, Dean of the Faculty, Mr. Pula and uh, the Chair of Geo Week 2022, uh, Dr. Sanka Perra, for organizing such wonderful activities uh, throughout this week, and extending uh, your tremendous support to make this symposium a success. Also, I would like to thank uh, all the uh, plenary speakers. So most of uh, them are international eminent pro uh, scholars uh, for your valuable time. We are eagerly looking forward to listen to them. Also, I would like to thank uh, all the chairs and rapporteurs and judge panel members uh, representing uh, various institutions. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Also, I would like to uh, thank all the academic non-academic and technical staff of the faculty. So without your support, uh, this event wouldn't be a reality. Especially, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Shehan Yattanayak, uh, our tech, uh, computer lecturer and our technical team for your valuable support uh, in online arrangements. Finally, I would like to invite everyone to join uh, the online technical sessions, which will be started shortly after this inauguration session and continue till uh, tomorrow evening. So thank you very much, and I hope uh, you will have a wonderful and a fruitful academic session ahead. So have a nice day. Thank you very much, sir. So with that, we are concluding the inauguration ceremony of GeoSIM 2022. And to follow the same, the respective technical sessions will commence. 
And the first technical session on serving and geodesy will start by 10.30 today. And the participants can join their uh, respective uh, technical sessions. And the technical session on land management will start by 2 o'clock today. And the technical session on hydrography will start at 8.30 tomorrow, 1st of uh, December 2022. And the technical session on integrated spatial science applications will start at 11.15 tomorrow, 1st of December. And the final, final technical session addresses the remote sensing and GIS, and the session will start at 2 p.m. tomorrow. So all the participants can join their respective technical sessions following the dates and times that are given to them. So finally, we warmly congratulate all the young scholars to their emerging academic arena. Thank you very much. Have a good day.
I warmly welcome all the participants and the resource persons for the first technical session on serving and geodesy. And Dr. A.K. R. N. Ranasinghe, senior lecturer, Department of Serving and Geodesy, will be handling the tech first technical session. So before handing over the session, let me tribute her with a small introduction. Dr. Ranasinghe obtained her PhD from the University of Maratua, Sri Lanka in 2019. She completed a MSc in Geoinformatics from University of Twente, the Netherlands, in 2006. She also completed the Bachelor of Serving Sciences from Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka in 2002. She's involved in integrated applied research with specific attention on microwave remote sensing for disaster investigation. Especially, she's interested in landslide in investigation through different change detection techniques and statistical image analysis by integrating radar and optical satellite images. Further, she's engaged in teaching multidisciplinary subjects as remote sensing, GIS, construction surveying, and advanced land surveying. So now, I would like to cordially invite Dr. A.K. R.N. Ranasinghe to conduct the first technical session on surveying and geodesy. Um, thank you, Dhananji. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, all, depending on your local time. Um, you all are welcome uh, for the uh, technical session of Serving and Geodesy, uh, Geosim uh, 2024. By initiating the session, um, it's an honor to me to introduce uh, Professor Wu Chen as our plenary speaker to this session. Um, Professor Wu Chen uh, joined the Hong Kong Polytechnic University in 2000 and currently is a professor and the head of the Department of Land Serving and Geoinformatics, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. He has been actively working on GNSS related research for over 30 years and has been working on a large number of research projects funded by universities governments and industries. His main research interests are geodesy and geodynamics, seamless positioning technologies, indoor positioning, navigation and integrity, GNSS positioning and application, system integration, GNSS performance evaluation, regional GPS network, wireless sensor network positioning, and airborne light applications. He has published over 300 te uh, technical papers in different journals and international conferences, submitted over 30 technical reports to various organizations, granted or filled more than 10 patents. Dear sir, uh, this is over to you uh, to do the plenary speech for this session. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you I hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, of course. We, yeah, we okay, I will share my screen. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, thanks, Chairman, and for the nice introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, and uh, good evening. And, uh, you know, very honored to be invited here to give a talk. And uh, today my talk is uh, about uh, simultaneous localization and uh, mapping based on a local sensor, and which is uh, RGBT sensors. Okay, and uh, in this talk, I will cover um, the a few parts, which is including the you know and the, the property of the error of the RGBD sensors, you know how to calculate them, and uh, very briefly talk about the algorithm and uh, you know how to using a robot to generate the three D maps of Momsley and uh, you know generate the three D model from the Johnny Cloud. Okay, that is the area to cover. And uh, nowadays, you know, and uh, you know, survey profession, we have 
moving from outside the general map to indoor maps. For example, in Hong Kong, uh, the, the you know, government is planning to develop uh, indoor maps for the whole cities within the next few years. And uh, in the indoor environment, one of the main tools would be based on ground. It means we use the also sensor, such as the camera, visor, and uh, that would be model in the indoor environment. At the same time, the slime technology has been widely used in navigation for autonomous vehicle robots in indoor energy analysis denied the environment. For the slime technology, I think if you look at the aggregate part, the main component is we call the alignment aggregate, which is using the two image or two frame of point cloud to determine the rotation and the translation between two camera or LiDAR post. Okay, that is, uh, you know, um, the fundamental algorithm and in that part. And uh, currently there are many systems or sensors available, for example, like a laser, camera, or RGBD sensor. Okay, and the uh, laser sensor, you know, are uh, with very high quality, to produce very high quality point clouds, but uh, we do have a lack of visual information, and uh, the price at the moment is still a little bit higher. And the full camera has been used for many, many years for slime. It is no cost. The visual information, this means features can easily be detected. However, it's a lack of scale. At the same time, you know, and uh, purely, you know, and the uh, 2D image base that uses the so called uh, SFM, which is uh, quite time consuming to process it. And uh, the third type of sensor, this is what we are, I'm going to cover today, is so called RGBD sensor. And uh, for RGBD sensor, it provides 3D information and provides the uh, image, RGBD image. It is a uh, very low cost. But the problem is uh, the measurement quality, okay, which is uh, normally quite known. And uh, then, you know, that is, uh, you know, many used, when it was invented, it was many used for the gaming industry, okay, which is accuracy was not the issue. But when you use it for the surveying type of work, it must be taken very carefully on those aerial sources, how to cut it. And uh, this is one of the examples we did in our lab, and uh, that Robert actually can autonomous, you know, navigating itself, scan the whole room, and uh, generate the 3D point cloud by using the RGBD sensor. And uh, then, you know, the, we can have the real-time state communication by using Wi-Fi to get the real-time data into the computer, and then we can generate the 3D model of the room in almost real time. Okay, we are talking about a few minutes later, maybe. And uh, however, as I just mentioned, by using this sort of sense, we need to take care of the arrow very, very carefully. Okay, the first thing is the arrow is uh, for the HBD sensor is uh, distance related. Okay, and here I give you roughly about the you know, example of two meters. Then, you know, the area is already four centimeters. Then the second thing is the distortion of the system. And uh, because the RGBD cycle we use is uh, the structure based. Okay, and if you need two, you need a two lens, one for projector and one for uh, receiving, you know, a, a camera, right? And then when these two, Lens, you know, combined together, generate the uh, distortion is different from just the camera. And uh, the system I mentioned here is uh, the, is the 
uh, you know, and uh, RTP this has uh, based on the structure light, okay? And uh, that another type of sensor is based on so called the, the TOF, okay? And but here, you know, I use the, the structure light sensor as an example. The structure light sensor basically is to transmit, you know, to emit a particular pattern, okay, which is on the red sun part right hand side of that picture and uh, then you know the camera will catch that pattern and to get the distance okay to get the distance because if it's far away from there that pattern size will get larger and then if they close that pattern sensor will be closed the actual measurement is what we call disparity okay is basically that distance okay and the disparities of measurement and uh, this formula is we convert that disparity to the range, okay, to the range of that object. And uh, if you look at the arrows, okay, and for the RGBD sensor, you know, that we talk about because of the measurement disparity, uh, firstly, it's a random error, okay, and uh, you know, we did a lot of tests, it is of a generally normal distribution. And uh, then the second part is the systematic errors, which including a different type of, you know, distortions on the lens. And uh, also, you know, we get, you know, the, the depth resolution error that basically is, you know, and, uh, almost fixed and the image resolution errors. Okay. And today I will talk about the mini, the, Second, and uh, if we're using the disparity, and uh, then and the image coordinate, you know, U and the V, we'll be able to get the 3D coordinate of the object, which is X, Y, and Z. So this means, uh, the, you know, and the, the X, Y, and the Z of the coordinate, which is the function of the measured distance Z you know, which is related to the disparity. So therefore, we'll be able to get the variance of any points, the 3D coordinate variance here, okay? And this is very important because this one is uh, being used for the optimization of your final, pro final alignment in the alignment algorithm. And uh, this we talk about the distortions, okay? And uh, if you look at the distortions, you know, because we use two sensors, and one is the projector, one is the camera, right? And then, you know, we're dealing with uh, different type of distortions. So this means we can not, you know, use a single model to model it. We need to model them separately. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one way, you know, generated the models, normally, you know, you need to know where is the distortion center, okay? And the uh, traditional approach, you know, and uh, people normally use the so-called, uh, you know, the, the center of the lens <coughs> as the distortion center, which is not changed. But uh, for the RGBD center, <laughs> the distortion center for the projector, which is changing with time. So it can with distance. So this means at a different distance, the projector distortion center are different. So this means when you combine that with the camera lens, okay, and uh, it will have quite strange shape of distortions, which is the show here. Okay, and the but you know it's not symmetrical. And uh, then, you know, we need to calibrate them. That is, you know, normal steps, you know, and uh, we establish a test field, and uh, that is the marks. And, uh, you know, we use that RGBD sensor to measure it at a different distance. <coughs> and then, you know, we try to solve most parameters related to different models. Then after that, we combine them as the final 
distortion models. Okay. And uh, you can see, you know, and uh, the property of the camera and the projector and the infrared they are different. Okay, so this means we need to combine three of them together. And uh, I would like to show you, you know, some results. Okay, and uh, we, this is the, for example, this is the whole image area. And uh, here we call the center area. And uh, this part we divide, we call it the edge area. Okay, and uh, then on this side of the slide, you know, you know before calibration and after calibration, what at accuracy we can get. So for result calibration, normally, you know, and, uh, you can get about two to three meters, okay, when we, you know, about <laughs> less than one centimeter accuracy. <coughs> However, when the distance is getting longer, the error is getting larger <coughs> and larger, okay? And uh, then after calibration, that is what we get, you know, and uh, up to eight meters, okay, we can achieve about you know, less than <coughs> 10 centimeters. If we talk about you know, and, uh, five to six meters, we can get you know less than one centimeter accuracy. In the age area, in the age area, sorry, in the age area, the arrow was much much bigger. Okay, without calibration, and uh, after calibration, and it can be significantly reduced. And uh, this shows some results and. Uh, in the close range, in the central area, we talk about you know fifty percent. <coughs> in the far range, we are talking about the seventy percent improvement after the corrections. And uh, this is the example which show you know and uh, on a wall, right? And uh, we can measure the distance, and uh, which is basically and uh, should be a plan surface. However, what we get from the red one that is without calibration, you can see the error very large, particularly on the edge side, okay, from the long distance. And after correction, you can see the shape is much better compared with that environment. And the uh, SLAM algorithm is uh, quite complicated, okay. And uh, before I introduce you know, some details, and uh, I will give you some locations, okay, and uh, we are going to use points, you know, and the line, and the line you can represent in different formats, and which is used for different type of, you know, and uh, presentation or optimization. And uh, basically, we're going to solve is this matrix, okay, is this matrix, we call the post representative this is the rotation matrix, this is the translation vector, three vector, three parameter here, and three parameter there. And this is three parameter we want to put to solve. We are going to use the points, we are going to use the lines, and also we are going to use the plans. Okay. And uh, in general, the SLAM algorithm can be divided into two parts. One part is the front end, the second part is the back end. The front end, including the feature extraction and uh, feature matching and uh, post optimization, this means you know we estimate the relative poles between two different epoch and uh, then to calculate the rotation and the translation parameters. On the back end, is uh, you we basically you know like the bundle adjustment. You to use a period of image to generate uh, 3D models, okay, to generate this 3D model. Also, it is used for loop closure for further improvement on the accuracy of the 3D product. And uh, this is the cost function. We try to minimize it, which we including the points including the 2D lines in the camera, including 3D lines, including the plans. Okay, also, because we work on robots, we also including the odometer, and also we include in the motion constraints. For example, in most of the time, the robot is moving on the plan, right? 
on the floor surface. So basically, it's some plan. So we can use and also on my hand assumptions. This means that most of the walls they are vertical, you know, to the ground, and uh, then we can use all this to constrain our solutions. And uh, because of you know when we match it, there are a lot of outliers. So this means we use uh, the Huber function, basically is uh, for the robust estimation, and uh, with uh, you know all this, you know, minimize them. And one of the important things you know, like mentioned is the covariance, okay, and the covariance because we have very, you know, and uh, accurate uh, covariance for the co every point, you know, every point, and then we can propagate that into the lines, into the plans, right? And, uh, you know, and we can get an optimized solution for this cost function. And uh, on the back end is uh, we basically using the graphic optimization and uh, using a fixed window of three seconds, you know, and uh, fixed window of three seconds. And uh, we minimize this mapping function. Okay, not only, you know, and between two is, you know, including a number of frames. Okay, we integrate them together and then, you know, to provide minimized solution. And also including the you know, the loop closure as well. And uh, for example, I give you a, a simple example of the points or, or lines, you know, and uh, then, you know, we are be able, you know, to firstly, you know, to find the common features, okay, using current, current measurements and uh, previous projections. And then we use, apply a filter to filter out the outlines and uh, then, you know, the 2D, the point, the projector arrow, this means that on the image, we have been able to form a formula like this, right? This is the current one, this is the uh, project one, and uh, this is one, and then we try to form parameter for the rotation and uh, translation. And uh, similarly, we can do the lines, we can do the, you know, on the 2D and the 3D, and also we can do the plans as well. Okay. In order to evaluate the accuracy or the relative accuracy of the results of different uh, tasks we carried out, we can use the absolute false error and uh, the point to point the distance. RMS, or if you compare different scenarios of data processing, you can use the relative improvement. Okay, you can use relative improvement to do this. And uh, this is one of the experiments we did. And uh, this is in our navigation lab. And uh, this is our final solution. Okay, this means including the Odometer, plan, land, and point. Okay, and uh, this is the one we compare with as an independent, that is an open source software package, that is ORB Step 2. And uh, this in between is the way using different constraints. For example, PL only use the point and the lines, PP only use the point and the plan. PLP point the line and the plan, and the WP using the point and the automatons. Okay, and uh, this one as our final solution is often. So you can see our results significantly better than that open source package. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, and uh, then we test them. And, uh, in different environments. This is another task we do on a corridor. In this corridor is in our, you know, in our office building. And uh, the distance of this line is around 70 meters. Okay, and uh, I will show the results. And uh, this is the result of the different, you know, and the scenarios that I mentioned. 
then you can see um, the, the improvement over our final solution over other solutions, you know, compared with uh, the ORP, which is the improvement is almost 70%. Okay, almost 70%. Okay, this is our final result. This is the result of the other part of ORP. And uh, now we try to test the different environments. For example, like uh, you have very rich textured things, you know, that image will be better, you know, to to find the features. And uh, then in this case, the result, you know, the improvement is uh, still very large, but, uh, you know, and uh, you are talking about 84% of the improvement. And uh, because, you know, the RB slam is mainly based on the points, okay? And uh, then, you know, our result can reach about, uh, you know, that is <laughs> about 24, <coughs> uh, you know, meter squares, and our result will achieve about the uh, centimeter lab accuracy of the uh, <coughs> This is another <laughs> experiment we did, is uh, in an area which have very less features, okay, low text, low text things. You can see one side is the, is the, you know, one side is the window wall and the other side have a, a lot of, you know, and uh, basically uh, <coughs> the curtains, okay, which is, uh, you know, and uh, we starting from here and we go this way and then coming back in that way. So this means we start in, in the same point, so the closure will tell us what is the absolute accuracy we can achieve. And uh, in this slide, we show the, you know, you only look at the closure error, okay? And in this case, the ORB does not work. If you only use the point of line, does not work because you lost track, okay? You lost track and then you, know, you are not able to provide the 3D, if, <coughs> 3D point cloud and uh, uh, 3D models, okay? And uh, in our case, we can achieve you know, the close area, that is 1.7 centimeter, okay? And uh, the area is about uh, 18 meters squared. And uh, so you can see we can get, you know, the, the close area is 1.7 centimeter, so it's pretty good. And uh, if you look at uh, the computation time, okay, and uh, our method is uh, slightly slower than the commercial package. Okay, we're talking about, uh, you know, and uh, about 100, roughly about uh, one second. Okay, and uh, that is sufficient for the ground control. And uh, Path planning and obstacle avoidance. And uh, then we need to do is, you know, and how to control that robot, okay? And we need to use the slam get the real time, the maps and the pose to control the movement of that robot, okay? That we call the exploration and path planning. And uh, in exploration, okay, that has been studied for many years, you know, many for the robot control. And uh, however, in our case, as the goal is to generate the 3D models. So therefore, we do not want, we get it, you know, and the, the quality is not good, and they will go back to survey again. So this means that when we do the exploration, we need to find the route which enable us to guarantee to have a good quality of the 3D for the cloud that allow us to generate the 3D models. Okay, and uh, so the requirement are different. And uh, in this case, we consider three strategies. The first strategy is mainly talk about the you know and the distance from the frontier, right? And uh, that is basically conventional the robot used to explore an unknown area. 
And uh, our strategy is the second and the third. The second one is to consider the number of features, okay? Because you have more features, and then you can speed up your robot and do survey it quickly. But if you have less features, this means you need to work slowly, okay? And then you need to work out slowly. This means you have sufficient features in the common area, in the you know common area that allow you to perform the slam, okay? Also, the feature distribution is a very important factor as well. And uh, the third strategy is uh, we, we combine two of them, you know, and this means the first one, the second one. One is only considered the distance to the frontier, the second is considered the slam quality, okay? And uh, then that is the, the area we just showed you before, that is the low test area, and uh, then we, in each room, we run three times, and uh, then that is uh, the result. If you only use uh, the first scenario, okay, the MS value we talk about is uh, around 10 centimeters, and uh, using the second scenario, the MS error, we can reduce to about uh, you know, the first centimeter, and uh, on the same scenario is also best. So this means you can see if you consider the quality of the quality <coughs> of your city modeling in the exploration strategy that do improve the quality of your measurements. Okay, and this is the total land you know to cover that room. Okay, I think it's 18 meters square. And uh, then, you know, we still can have some improvement, okay, over the traditional one. And on the time is uh, not too much, you know, slightly improvement, you know, and about, you know, 27% improvement. And uh, if you have more features in the room, right, and uh, then improvement will be less, right? Improvement will be less. Okay, on the accuracy because you have more features, you know, and uh, the normal, you know, and the uh, strategy will be okay. And uh, this will have a very rich, you know, texture. In this environment, you can see the improvement is even less, right? So this means, you know, when you have the rich texture and uh, then, you know, you're without, the, you know, using, uh, you know, will be very similar, okay? And different scenarios will be very similar. And uh, so that is uh, exploration. And uh, the final part I would like to talk about is if we get the point cloud, and uh, how can we to generate the 3D models autonomously? Okay, this means without human intervention to generate the 3D model based on the point cloud we get from that robot. And uh, firstly, you know we need to have data, right? And uh, you know the sensor needs to be calibrated. Then we get an RGBD image. We get the raw depth image, and uh, then you know combine this together, and uh, we make the data preparation. And uh, then that data will go through a neural network, and uh, basically to do the classifications of the different features, for example, like, the, you know, walls, you know, and the floors, ceilings, windows, doors, and etc. okay? And uh, we separate them, and then, you know, and then you have the 3D model, you know, for the cloud, and then you can, based on that classification, and then, you know, the different colors, and you know, get the property of those points. And uh, finally, and uh, we extract the windows, doors, you know, floors and ceilings, walls, and finally to generate the street model auto automatically. And uh, this is uh, the, you know, the semantic uh, reconstruction flowchart. You know, you gather the data, you generate and uh, the scout, you know, and the image. And then you know you go through that you know, training model, 
and uh, then you do the classification. Okay, that basically is the classification of that sort of model you have. And uh, then you integrate the 2D and uh, then, you know, integrate the classic picture and uh, the construction. And uh, I'm about you know, to say about the detail about uh, the neural network. Okay, we use basically is uh, the FCN, uh, very classic, you know, and uh, neural network to train our data. And uh, also we use the conditional random field and COB as a you know, and uh, to enhance the FCN performance. And uh, this is uh, the results uh, for classification and uh, summarized on the pixel accuracy. So you can see if you use the traditional FCN, you get about 84. And uh, if you combine them together, you get about 89%, about 5% improvement on the classification on the pixel level. And uh, this is uh, the results. And uh, okay, we get the colored, you know, point clouds. That is what we get from the, you know, the robots. And uh, this is the classification of the results. And uh, we, the basic problem with generous 3D model compared with, uh, you know, using the laser scanner is the accuracy. Okay, and use laser scanner, you know, like those corners, you can get a very precise, you know, corners, you know, and from the laser. However, this is what we get from the RGBD sensor, which is you know, not very good, right? And also, you know, the voltage level is very, very high compared with the, the laser. Okay, that is the solid means the special algorithm in the top seven, where you using those uh, low cost RGBD sensor to generate the same problem. And uh, then, you know, the challenge And uh, we use some algorithm, particularly shaped for the low cost RGBD uh, sensors. And uh, you know, here are some example of it. Okay, for example, this is you know the raw, the wall point cloud. Okay, you filter it, and uh, then you segment the wall into different parts, and then you get the ceiling, and then we project the ceiling down to the ground. Okay, and then you get the the, you know, the, the lines, right? The lines of the room. And uh, however, this part are not good. So this means you need to use some algorithm to modify it, okay? To have those corners to extract it out. And uh, for the windows and the doors, you know, that is the, the, you know, we extract from the point cloud of the doors and this of the windows and how to we replace this with the models. So what we do is uh, we try to get the central point, okay, get the size and get the central point of this object, okay, and then, you know, as long as you get the central point, you get the size of it, and then you can replace by the models of the doors and windows. And uh, this is the basically the out, you know, from, you know, we did uh, and uh, three rooms, okay, we did three rooms, so that's an example, and the room of the house is separate, and we have a lot of generate others. And uh, this is uh, what we get from RGBD sensor, this is what we get from the laser, okay, we simply, you know, from the laser is much better, okay, and uh, then, you know, we get these two models, and then we can make the comparison of them. And uh, this is the dimension, okay, of the rooms. And we get it from the RGBD and uh, the laser, okay. Then you can see, compared with the laser ones, the RGBD, we can, the arrows we're talking about, uh, is about 10 centimeters, okay, and about 10 centimeters. General, 
that is the, if you compare the size of the room, we're talking about you know seven meters, and uh, you know the accuracy is about ninety eight percent compared with the the laser ones. Okay, about ten centimeter accuracy. And uh, if you look at the, the area, and uh, the area we are roughly talking about uh, is around the you know, some light ones, between the general ones, and the two meter light. And uh, if you look at the time, okay, the time needed to do these three routes, okay, these three routes, okay, and uh, this is the number of point cloud we get from the laser. This is the number of, you know, the point cloud points we get from the structure sensors between the RTBD sensors. And uh, this is the data collection time, and uh, this is the processing time. And uh, we also use the, you know, simple room funding, right? Because the two rooms are quite effective. And uh, the time we're talking about these three rooms come together with uh, 200 million to 200 million. But uh, for our method, the IPD sensor, you know, track the data, you know, and the, the data processing on the site, we can get these three rooms about, you know, less than 10 minutes, okay, 60 minutes. And uh, so that is, I guess, you know, significantly improve the efficiency of the measurements. And uh, for most of the application, I think uh, the, for the indoor city modeling, I think uh, about a 10 centimeter accuracy for you know, normal size room is uh, acceptable. And uh, basically, in this presentation, we Describe a system we developed, you know, basically a robot or autonomous indoor mapping, okay, or indoor city model. And uh, we have demonstrated, you know, using the RGPD sensor, which is the price of about uh, and, uh, 200 US dollars, okay, and that can be used for indoor city modeling with the accuracy of decimal level for a normal. You know, size of the room, for example, 10 meter by 10 meter, 10 meter by 10 meter. And uh, by using this type of low and calibration, okay, and uh, for improved accuracy, and also for the extending of the operational range. Without calibration, only use the level of the distance of the But uh, by using the, uh, you know, other kind And uh, both of waiting, okay, it is needed for flying solution. Okay, without in a proper waiting of the, your measurement because the line, the plan, all derived from the point cloud, right? So it means the accuracy, the accuracy indicator of the point cloud is crucial for the optimal And then we can because in the room environment, we have enhanced plan for performance to multiple constraints. For example, we can constrain you know, the, the floor is a fan, we can control you know, the wall is a vertical constraint, and the touch well, uh, by using those properties. And uh, finally, is, you know, in the world, we're using the robot for the 3D modeling, you know, and the, the mapping quality. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, remarkable speech uh, to this session. Um, now the time for the audience. So if you have any questions or any matters to be cleared. So now the Professor Uchen is here for you.
Uh, Professor Chen, uh, I'm Miranda from uh, the Faculty of Geomatics, lecturer from the, as well as the, one of the members in this uh, Ponaisin team. So it's really uh, interesting to see that uh, your presentation also synchronized with the previous one with the Professor Vasilis. I mean, it's all talking about the sensor integration and positioning and navigation, including um, yours also something similar. So it's uh, really, uh, this is, as we see, the, this is the future of the surveying profession. So the direction is towards the sensor integration and more to the artificial intelligence. And slowly maybe the real, uh, you know, field work of the surveying data collection will be taken over by these, you know, robots, so <laughs> whatever we can call it. <laughs> So, I mean, just a general question. I'm not a question. I mean, you're, you're, I just want to, you know, based on your, you know, experience as well as what we're engaging currently on this robotics and the sensor integration. I mean, how do you project the future of the surveying profession in the coming years, maybe another 10 years time or so? <laughs> so, it's a really general thing I want to, you know. Okay, so a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the survey in 10 years and uh, basically I think that there are a few things you know and uh, more and more if you look at it you know, so I'm you know talking about you know, I'm not talking about the robot okay and uh, so you can think about you know, traditionally survey only creative reduce the demand right and uh, you know that is one of the important work and uh, then we do the you know control network but now you think about the control network do we really need it? Because, you know, as far as we have the ADP network, right? And then, you know, in the area, you just use the GPS, you can get your control point within seconds, right? So this means, you know, that sort of traditional control network type of job, you know, we still need it for high demand because, you know, that is up there, right? But uh, for the parental control, you know, I think GPS can be placed. That is, you know, one thing I can see. The second thing is, you know, and the more and more is the robot and the UAV. The robot, the indoor environment, and the UAV for the outdoor environment. So this means, you know, and, you know, now people already started, you know, and uh, because you know, MMS is one of the system what in for twenty years, right? And uh, <laughs> that you need, uh, you know. Creating of many sensors, and uh, but uh, you need to maintain the reference grade by using GPS and LMS mm -hmm. and uh, high quality LMS, right? And uh, in the future, do we really need a high quality LMS? I think that, that is another question. Maybe not, because now people is already you know started to do experiment with UAV to do the topography event without ground control, right? Without that, you know, MMS is uh, one of the applications without ground control, right? You do not need the ground control to get you know, the surrounding maps. But uh, I think, uh, you know, if even, you know, if we can remove the requirement of high quality LMS, that will be the next step. So this means in the future, I believe, is not the, you know, the hardware issues. I think it's the data process issues. Can we get in real time? That is the key. I think that, that would be the key. This means all the image processing, point of cloud processing, everything go time. You know, now the ground control is in real time, right? At the end, that is you know, real time at the ground control point. Then this means you don't need you know, ground control for ground anymore. Mm -hmm. And in the topographic mapping, you know, then about the emergency, emergency situations, we talk about the, you know, the you know, slide happening. Can we get all those information real time? I think that could be a future challenge in data processing. That's why we need, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, faster speed algorithms, such as machine learning, such as the neural network, that sort of things. And I think all put into one framework. That is, you know, my personal view. You know. <laughs> and, uh, <because> yeah. <laughs> Not really a question. I'm just, you know, just my curiosity. Just, you know, you arose yeah. because in the morning yeah. also we have seen a very nice presentation and yours is also a kind of extension of the same thing. So that's, you know, you know, kind of a, 
giving a nice picture that way where, where is our profession and where is our education should be heading if you are preparing our student to the future so really thank you very much for your explanation as well as a wonderful presentation yeah, hello uh, professor, yeah professor Jane, uh, can I ask a question, Professor? Yeah, 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 yeah. Brian, you yes. can take. Brian, you can take. Yes, no. yes. Uh, your, I mean, the presentation is very impressive. I, I mean, integrating uh, RGBD model to scan. I mean, Indo, uh, Indo scenes. Now, my question is now: if we video, if we if we scan a series of window scenes, which which have a certain overlap, say twenty to twenty five overlap. How are you going to register these uh, scans in a way that you maintain the same accuracy of a single scan? I mean, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, you get a decimeter level accuracy. But if you make a series of scans in those scans, and you need to georeference these scans so that you can get accurate points on ground, Using image registration, how are you going to maintain the accuracy? Because uh, you are talking about the depth as well, using disparity, I mean, uh, a technique you use. Yes. Okay. And uh, I think that there are two issues. Okay. The first issue is SLAM itself does not give you the joint reference. The SLAM itself does not give you joint references at all because the slime is a relative operation, right? Slime is a relative operation. So you only have the relative operation. Does not give you the absolute the, the georefins, like, you know, and the directly put it to the map. You do not do that because you do not have that information with slime. And then, however, it can enhance it by many different ways, you know, and basically, you know, slime is an optimization, right? And then we all know, you know, and any match, and then, you know, the arrow will be have a drift arrow pretty much on the larger. Then what you need to do is, you know, and the internally you do the closure. Because you can always do the loop closure. Loop closure enable you to reduce the effect of that drift arrow. Right? And, uh, you know, in the internally, that is still internal. You know, you cannot have absolute coordinate. And for absolute coordinate, you have to rely on the Ground cover point. You have to rely on the ground cover point because only this, you know, that can link to the, you know, the global georeferencing or regional georeferencing for the indoor environment. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Professor, you, uh, I'm Indika. And yeah. uh, uh, it's nice to, you know, hear from you uh, from the Hong Kong, and uh, it's nice to see the wonderful presentation. And I can, you know, understand that the real, real application of uh, SLAM is, you know, for future survey with robotics uh, and all that. But just, you know, the not the question actually, just to add uh, your, you know, your presentation. And for my uh, personal knowledge, you know, what are the requirement of the system requirement of uh, this? Uh, can you quickly explain for that uh, special requirement uh, for this uh, system? Yeah, actually, it does not does not have much requirement. Basically, is uh, you know, we what are we trying to do? Because Hong Kong is going to, you know, and uh, in the next few years, and they will do a lot of work for the indoor survey. Because for all the outdoor survey, you know, and the map updating, and uh, you know, Hong Kong City, you know, have done enough. Yeah. And they will do a lot of things, you know, and towards the indoor survey. And uh, for the indoor survey, of course, you know, and uh, you can have, you know, the backpack, you know, and the people, you know, walking around, you now and to do it, right? But uh, we think that, you know, alternatively, you can use the robot to do it. Then the robot, you can do it 24 hours, you know, and uh, and uh, now the robot has been used everywhere, right? And uh, that's why, you know, we use this one. And uh, so, for example, of course, you can now, particularly today, I talk about HPD sensor. And uh, when the LIDAR, you know, if you if you for surveying, you can use the lidar, and then you know you just you know change the RGBD sensor to the lidar camera, you know, and uh, then that will give you much higher accuracy. Mm. Then you know, then you can get roughly you know in this sort of environment get a centimeter light. And uh, however, for most of application, because you know you think about you know for navigation, you know for that, I think you know ten centimeters is good enough. 
And uh, if you want to, you know, higher accuracy or anything, just to change that sensor from the RGBD sensor to light. Okay, thanks, Dr. Um, okay, um, thank you very much, sir, uh, again, uh, for making our event lighten uh, from your impressive uh, plenary speech. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, by uh, moving to the next item, um, I'm going to introduce uh, the chair to this session today. Um, Actually, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Gopisinghe as the chair to this uh, session today, uh, Josim uh, 2022, uh, the serving and geodesy session, especially. Um, Dr. Brian Gopisinghe uh, joined the survey department of Sri Lanka in year 1992 and currently working in the same department as a senior superintendent of surveys from year 2016. He was graduated by bachelor's degree in serving sciences from the Institute of Serving and Mapping, Yatalava, and uh, completed a master's in geoinformation science and earth observation uh, from the University of Twente, the Netherlands, in year 2006. Uh, Dr. Rupasing holds a PhD from the University of East London, UK, in year 2015. His main research uh, interests are GIS, spatial data infrastructure, construction and engineering surveys, digital mapping with UAVs, LIDAR surveys, location-based services, uh, global navigation systems, open source software, automated map generalization, visualization, object-oriented programming using Java, Python, and MATLAB. And also, um, I want to introduce the judge panel today uh, to evaluate the presentations and presenters uh, for the general publication, especially there are three judge uh, members in the judge panel, uh, Dr. M.D. E.K. Gunatilaka and Mr. Indy Pereira and Mr. K.K. D.W.S. Pandangara uh, from the Department of uh, Serving and Geodesy, Faculty of Geomatics. Um, Dr. Brian, now this is over to you. Uh, to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair the first session on serving and geodesy in the second international symposium on, on of geoinformatics. Uh, I think uh, in the first session we have uh, six presenters. Uh, I, as I went through, the abstracts, I, I realized that two papers are, I mean, related to geophysics and the other papers are related to survey. So, I mean, since the time is running out, uh, without having more, uh, I mean, uh, uh, briefing, I, I would like to invite the first presenter. Uh, she's a Mrs. Uh, Amruta from the Mahatma Gandhi University of India uh, to, I mean, get the stage. Uh, before that, uh, I would like to say that uh, each presentation is a pre-recorded uh, video and including the Q&A session, each presenter has only 15 minutes. So I will ask each presenter to I, be on time and make their presentation. And after the presentation, uh, there is a panel. Uh, there is a panel of judges who will ask questions, and also the, your the questions are open to the audience. So thank you very much, and I will ask Mrs. Amrita to make a presentation. Good morning, all. Myself Amrita and I am from Dr. R. Sadiq Center for Remote Sensing and GIS, School of Environmental Sciences, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala in India. And my topic is Geospatial Investigation of Torrential Rainfall Induced Landslides on the Windward Side of Western Worlds, aka Study of Kutikal, Kerala in India. 
The Western Ghats is a great escarpment of India which runs parallel to the western coast of Indian Peninsula. It divides the Deccan Plateau from Western Coastal Plain and it's highly susceptible to landslides. As we know, landslide is a gravity driven movement of rock or debris. But these landslides create thousands of casualties each year. And the uh, interesting fact is that these are generally monsoon driven calamities. In recent years, the climatic conditions of Indian Peninsula has changed and these increase in rainfall resulted in the increase in frequency of landslides in Western Ghats. From 2018 onwards, the windward slope of Western Ghats has, played, has faced numerous landslide calamities. The recent, was, the recent torrential rainfall was on 2021. It was as a result of cloud burst on 2021 October 16, and it resulted in landslides and landslide induced floods in Manimala River Basin, which is a major river basin of Kerala originating from Western Ghats. And these are some national daily headlines of that landslide calamity. And this is my study area. And it is Manimala River Basin, which is a major river basin of Kerala originating from Western Ghats. And the landslide impacted area could be situated within the boundary of Manimala River Basin. Uh, and it is a, uh, on the foothills of uh, Western Ghats. It is a small town. And also uh, the Madhav Karikul report of Western Ghats conservation. Uh, the area is under the ecological sensitive zone. This was the methodology that I have opted for my study. Uh, as, a, as a part of my study, I have conducted a field visit immediately after the landslide event. And also I have prepared a landslide inventory map uh, and almost 52 points were collected from the, uh, from the region, uh, the cortical itself. And the various things, uh, I have used 17 things for my study. These various things were collected from various sources such as survey opinion topo sheets, geological map of GSI, the Landsat XRP okay. images and just disk and also benchmark soils of Kerala and Google Earth and the Kuban uh, GMG and REGA. And these uh, were used for frequency ratio analysis and I have prepared a few Landsat susceptibility zones. So the frequency ratio method is far better than the other methods because it considers the terrain factors also not only the um, uh, not only about it, it is not only depend upon the author's uh, uh, author's perspective. So at first the frequency ratio was calculated by landslide occurrence percentage divided by area occurrence percentage. That is number of landslides in factor class I divided by total number of landslides. The whole divided by total number of cells in each factor class divided by total number of cells. And by assigning frequency ratio of each uh, class, uh, each, I mean each theme, I have uh, added these layers to uh, uh, find out the landslide susceptibility of the total area. So there are various factors that contribute to the landslide susceptibility, such so as topographical factors, the geological factors, climatological factors, and the anthropogenic factors. So the first one is topographical factors. The first topographical factor I have considered is slope. And as already uh, the, the already the studies mentioned that these western birds are highly susceptible to landslides uh, in which slopes greater than 20 degree. And in the case also, uh, most of the landslides were within 17 degree, uh, greater than 17 degree, 17 degree to 30 area. And also the aspect was considered the north, northeast and north, southwest uh, aspects were highly susceptible for land. And the case of curvature, both the concave and convex curvature were susceptible for landslides. And the NTBI was also calculated. The data was obtained from Landsat T. And it was observed that in the case of NTBI, it, uh, the value between, within 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 has highly susceptible to landslides. And streams are the major sculptures of earth and it has a great impact in the erosion of an area and hence the stream density and distance from streams are considered and from uh, stream density it was observed that uh, the stream density between 3 to 4 has a high impact in landslide susceptibility and whenever when I consider the distance from streams it was observed that uh, these uh, 
the areas within 100 meters of the stream network is highly susceptible to landslide. And as we move away from the stream network, the, the um, landslide, landslide susceptibility decreases. And the geological factors are also considered. The major geological factor considered are lithology and also the structural and soil parameters considered. In the case of lithology, the area is a Chanakai terrain. The entire Chanakai terrain is highly susceptible to landslides. Then the linear wind density has also considered and the linear wind density less than 0 0.3 is highly susceptible uh, to landslide. The geomorphology were considered and uh, in the case of geomorphology, the area is may, uh, majorly consists of denudational structure hills and it was observed that these denudational structure hills is highly vulnerable to landslide. And the soil has a great impact in the case of western guns. Because the hilly area of the entire state of Kerala is uh, characterized by a thin veneer of unconsolidated soil resting above the massive Precambrian rock. Usually, the glide planes of uh, these limestones are contact zones of the two lithosoils. And hence, both the soil texture and soil depth are uh, considered. In the case of soil texture, gravelly loam is highly susceptible for landslides. And in the case of soil depth, the very deep. Uh, so it's with this very deep uh, uh, yeah, gliding, uh, the very deep in the zones are susceptible to landslides. Is a triggering factor of each landslide is the climatical conditions. So I have used the precipitation. The average annual rainfall of 10 years was considered. And when I consider the rainfall, all the uh, the entire area uh, which is susceptible to landslide has only two, less than 2600 millimeter of rainfall. It is comparably less than the average rainfalls of Kerala. And in the case of soil moisture also, the soil moisture is 0 to 200, uh, minus 200. So, there is an, there uh, exists a sudden cause for these uh, landslides. So, I have uh, um, taken the data from high uh, uh, Kandirapalli rain gauge which is the nearest range station of the study area. And by analyzing this uh, study area, this is the hydrograph of October 20, 2021. And from the hydrograph, it has been observed that October 16 itself has 2006, 266 millimeter rainfall, which is uh, greater than the average rainfall of, uh, which is greater than the uh, uh, cumulative rainfall of 10 days. And hence, this high rainfall was sufficient enough to trigger a landslide. And the anthropogenic factors were considered. The anthropogenic factors include the human involved cons uh, cons um, human involved constructions. So the first one I have considered is uh, roads. Uh, because in mountainous region, the construction of communication networks, including roads and railway, often leads to the destabilization of the slope and eventually landslide. The same was observed here. Uh, all these landslide points are within the 500 meter distance of the road and hence uh, it was also observed that when we move away from the roads, the landslide susceptibility decreases. Also the quarries were considered. All these landslide points are within the 5000 meter distance of these quarries. And the built up density was also calculated and it was observed that in the, uh, the built up density greater than 2000 has highly susceptible to landslide. And the other observation was uh, watershed management works. From field visit, it was known that these areas have undergone severe type of watershed management works because uh, there were numerous rainwater pits. So the points where watershed uh, management works were considered were taken. And it was noted that all these um, landslide points are within 1500 meters of this landslide, uh, these watershed area management works. Because in an unstable slope, in every effort should be made to ensure that surface water is carried away from the slope. Unfortunately, this area has numerous rain pits which increases the saturation of the soil column. Placing all these 79 factors, I have prepared a landslide susceptibility zonation. From this zone, it was noted that only 5% area is highly susceptible to landslides. It comes only 49 km squares and power percentage is high and 28% is medium and 63% is low. But the, um, so unfortunately, 
Uh, only these uh, five percent again is is high uh, highly susceptible for landslide, but it consists of ninety percent of cortical fungi, and also a frequency diagram uh, prepared. From this cumulative frequency diagram, it was observed that ten percent of the area has ninety percent of landslide, and the thirty-seven percent percentage of the area is uh, has at least landslide susceptibility. From my studies, I have concluded that. There were so many inherent causes for the um, uh, landslide susceptibility, such as slope angle greater than 17 degrees, the north, north and northwest uh, facing slopes, the inundation and structural hills of Stanakai terrain with high built-up density, and also the unscientific construction of roads. And this watershed management have works have a long-lasting impact on this uh, area. And the immediate cause was the torrential rainfall, which occurred on October 16 as a result of cloud burst. And my suggestion here is the a detailed environmental impact assessment of the roads and watershed management works performed in that area should be considered. So that's all about my work. Any questions from the audience? questions from the panel of judges i think time is limited so we have to yeah chairman just uh, you know just to stimulate a kind of a discussion so amrita uh, what were the challenges that you faced you know it's, it's really difficult you know to make a you know real uh, realistic uh, computation of all those things so what were your parameters and what were the challenges that you faced in your study Morning, sir. The first challenge was to collect all these landslide points. Uh, on, on, due to that landslide event, most of the roads were blocked, uh, so it was very difficult to access those places for uh, that point collection. And uh, there was a uh, generation of this uh, data. So the, even that rainfall, in the case of rainfall data, the, the average of 10 years were considered. So it was, uh, it was a hectic fact to pro uh, process all this data. That was the major challenges that I was faced. So have you considered the you know the ground slope and those parameters as well? Ah yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, Amruta, uh, uh, there's a question from me. Thank you. Uh, now the technique you used uh, is uh, frequency ratio. And uh, one of the anthropogenic yes, activities is mining in this area. So, to, uh, up to what extent ah, yes, can your I mean can your algorithm uh, detect these mining? Um, I mean the depth of mining. Up to what extent have you I mean considered the depth of mining in your research? Actually, sir, the, um, generally the mining uh, happening in Kerala is subsurface mining. So it is uh, not about the depth. It is quarry. Uh, so it's not about just subsurface one. So it's a quarry. The area of ah, your yes. research was a quarry. Ah, there was a quarry. Uh, and all these landslide points are within 5,000 meter distance from this quarry. Any other questions? If there are no any other questions, uh, I think thank you very much for your presentation. And we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, the second present is uh, Mr. Prabhat Manuranga from the General Sir John Patlala. Defense University. It's over to you.
Good morning all of you. I am BMN Premaratna. I am going to talk about the extraction of power line corridor by using drone images and point cloud. I will go through these contents to present this presentation. Let's move to the introduction. Power lines are cable which transmit electricity. They must link between the frameworks of the tower. These towers and power line cables built with a view to safety and economic viability. In the modern world, it is very important to have an uninterrupted power supply for the efficient functioning of human work, industry and other work relevant on electricity. Their environmental conditions may cause several treat for the existing power line corridor such as rural village area, outside the road network, forest areas and high rise building area. These transmission lines are not covered by an insulin cell. Insulation provides the air around them. Therefore, features near to the line can cause to the electric car. High vegetation near or under the power lines are the causes of short circuit which damage to the power lines. Therefore, maintain the proper ground clearance is important because improper ground clearance can cause to the serious accidents. Ceylon Electricity Board uses numerous manpower to maintain the corridor of power line transmission. Traditionally, this kind of utility management tasks achieve primarily based on the manual inspection of the power line corridors. This way of inspection is very expensive, time consuming and hard to complete within a given time frame. The aim of the study is creates an automatic system to find the power line corridor. Statement of problem. In Sri Lanka, power lines are investigated by using the conventional way. The power lines were investigated manually on the ground to get a clear idea about its corridor. This way of approach takes more manpower, time wasting and need a high cost. Other method of power line corridor mappings are very expensive like LiDAR method. Ground survey method are very hard to conduct and time consumption is very high. It is important to create a 3D model of the power line corridor and extract the power line for the maintenance and to provide uninterrupted power supply all over the country. Uh, next we can consider about research questions. First one, what are the existing methods used for power line corridor mapping in Sri Lanka? Uh, second one, how to use drone point cloud data with power line corridor mapping? Uh, last one, how to create an automatic system to find the power line using point cloud data. These are my research objectives. Uh, general objective is to develop an efficient and accurate automated power line corridor extraction system using drone images and its point cloud data. Uh, specific objectives are to identify about the existing power line mapping method in Sri Lanka, to use drone survey for power line mapping and generate point cloud using drone images, to develop an efficient and accurate automated system to find the safe ground clearance for a power line. These are some of the major literature review in my research. Now we can consider the methodology. I found my study area which is near the Kotalawal Defense University Southern Campus. I used fixed 4 capture software to design a flight plan and other things. I used the default camera on the DJI Panther 4 to collect my data. In this case, I used the UTM coordinate system. I used fixed body capture software to process my data and I got my point cloud. During the data analysis step, I analyzed the data using Python 3.7.0 version. When we consider the specific objectives, there is one object to identify regarding the existing power line mapping method in Sri Lanka. According to the Ceylon Electricity Board website, in Sri Lanka, power lines are traditionally investigated in a traditional manner. That means power lines are manually investigated on the ground to get a better idea of their corridor. This method necessity more manpower, time and a significant financial investment. In Sri Lanka, total station and GNN system are used for the power line corridor mapping purposes. Development of Python software as the first step, identify the electric posts. The fixed body mapper software is used to obtain the list of coordinates. 
the coordinates are then accordingly copied to a notepad. The power line, the safety level system, the cursor places, and the power line corridor are then created using the input coordinates. Finally, I combine all the parts using Python and created the corridor mapper software using HTML. Moving to the analysis and results, if we consider about the final outputs of this software, those results can define as five outputs. Those are middle power line, left and right power line, safety wall, identify the cause and places, and corridor wall. Now we can consider the middle power line. As the first step, an electric post was identified using the coordinates of the electric post. The fixed body mapper software was used to obtain the list of coordinates. Then the list of coordinates was copied to a notepad in an ordinary fashion. From here, the identification of the electric post was completed. Secondly, obtain coordinate for the input into the Python software. The middle power line is drawn using the obtain coordinate as the first step of the Python software. Finger 1 shows the coordinate of the electric post. Finger 2 shows the middle power line side view. And Finger 3 shows the top view of the middle power line. Next, left and right power lines are created using middle power line coordinates. These lines are generated by keeping a distance of 1.2 meters from the middle power line. First, points were generated using main line coordinates after those lines were generated using the points. The all power lines are shown as black line. Finger 1, 2 and 3 depict the power lines top, side and along views respectively. The next safety level is created using the middle power line coordinates. The safety level is maintained at 2.7 meters below the power line according to the Ceylon electricity board rules and regulations. As the third step of the Python software, the safety line in red is generated below 2.7 meters from the middle power line. Fingers 1, 2 and 3 depict the alarm, side and top views of the safety level respectively. Considering the identify the cause and places. If there are any obstacle between the 2.7 meters range or in the safety zone, they will be clearly visible due to the red color safety zone. Fingers 1, 2, 3 represent the obstacle along side and top views respectively. Finally, we can consider about the corridor wall. The power line corridor is created from the coordinate list that was initially provided. The power line corridor is represented by two walls on either side of the electric post in Python software. According to the rules and regulation of CEB, the 11 kilowatt power line should be maintained in the 1.5 meter power line corridor on both sides from the left and right power line. Therefore, it has a 5 meter power line corridor. Finger 1 shows the top view of the corridor and finger 2 shows the side view and finally finger 3 shows the inside of the corridor wall. The vegetation between the yellow corridor wall must be kept clear. Now you can see a demonstration of the corridor mapper software. We can check the python codes by using the command. Next, you type the code and Visual Studio Code software appears with the Python codes. Then we can run the codes. Here, this is the interface of the Corridor Mapper software. Then we can add the files. First, we have to add the point cloud file. Next, we can add the coordinate file. Now, we must click the create button for the processing part. This take little time to process the data. This is the appearance of the data. We can change the color to improve the appearance. 
in this we can clearly see the power line safety zones and power line corridor this area must be clear Conclusion uh, This study was conducted near to the Kotral Defense Unit in the Southern Campus. DJ Pantham for drone was used for the data collection purposes. Fixed body mapper software was used for the processing of the images which were taken from the drone. Software was created with using the Python programming language. And finally, all objective completed. Next, you can consider about the limitation and further research direction. Uh, first, you can consider about the limitation. This study did not consider the sag of the power line, and this study did not use the GCP. Uh, if we consider the further research direction, this study can be conducted for all the power line system in Sri Lanka. LiDAR system could be used for the conduct of the study. This software can develop up to the fully automated system by using model of the electric post, and accuracy can be assessed using the total station or RTK method. These are my references. And thank you. Good morning, all of you. I am thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, now the floor is open to audience for questions. Uh, good good afternoon, uh, Manranga. I'm Kannangara here, uh, yep. lecturer from the Faculty of Geometrics. Uh, just a, a, a one brief question. Now you uh, evaluate the center line of the power line, uh, and do you have uh, uh, some statistics? But accuracy, like, do you, have you done a ground truth validation? Like, what is the accuracy of this uh, center line in yes, uh, meters? So? Yeah, because it is very near to our uh, university. Therefore, uh, we conducted the uh, ground uh, verifications. Uh, but in this case, uh, because uh, we thought uh, when we are using the drones, uh, we can capture the uh, points of the uh, power line. But uh, because uh, when we are processing, we we couldn't find, because it is very, uh, the line is very small, uh, we couldn't find. That's why we use uh, Python code to create a line. After that, uh, we check the uh, whatever the results uh, physically. Yeah. So, uh, do you have some statistic? How, what What was the deviation? Like, what is the uh, uh, relative that, uh, deviation? Uh, <laughs> there's no any kind of uh, it means uh, because uh, we followed the um, uh, CEB regulations. It was mentioned uh, within the limits uh, we can we have to find the uh, ground clearance it means uh, 2.5 meter either side of the uh, each and every uh, uh, light poles um, maybe i will uh, ask in different way now okay. do you have you said do you have the coordinates okay. of the yeah but you said you didn't use the gcp right but yeah. let's say in 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 coordinate system, like what is the difference actual coordinates and what is the difference of uh, what is what you obtain? How many uh, difference uh, of this center line deviates? Uh, we were not uh, checked that one because uh, or, already it was mentioned. I didn't. Uh, we were not uh, use the GP, uh, GCP. Only the uh, satellite that uh, data uh, of the uh, drones. It was uh, given according to WGS eighty four. That's one we were not checked, but uh, the difference that uh, but uh, we were found the uh, distance between the uh, light poles. It was matching according to the uh, our results. That's why we checked uh, because uh, okay. still we were not considered the uh, we were not checked the GCP with the GCPs. Okay, all right. Thank you. One more question from me. Uh, 
Now you mentioned that you use Python yeah. to extract uh, points from the images. Yes. Sir. I mean, uh, especially the light post. Yeah. So how did you identify? I mean, using Python. So from the images, how did you identify what what algorithm or what mechanism you use to identify extract power? Because post? within this area, we were in a very low uh, undulated area. The light posts are the very uh, highest one within this area. That method we used. So what happens if there is a tall tree in between uh, the power the, power lines, uh, power yeah. points? The, within the power, the within the area, we were not found any uh, that kind of uh, trees. Sir. Okay, but now in uh, your, and also I mean, paper uh, you have mentioned that this is uh, a good yeah. It uh, the same way uh, when we are uh, the Python, we can give the uh, uh, shape of the uh, light pole. It also. Uh, what can you give Python? The the size that. Uh, when it uh, when we go through the uh, size size of the light yeah, pole size okay. of size of the light pole and also the shape of the light pole both uh, now, can be given the, to identify the, yes okay then from the 3d image you created yeah. the using uh, the last software like, i can't remember the name mapper uh, uh, so, mapper uh, mobile mapper yeah, mobile. so is it possible to digitize and create a vector data Create a vector for output from your image. Still, it is not, sir. We were just uh, used to uh, identify the location, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sir. Any other questions? Uh, uh, hello, uh, I am Andy Perera, senior hydrographer, uh, senior yeah. lecturer at the Faculty of Geometrics. Uh, I have one uh, uh, thing to uh, clarify. Uh, uh, is it clear to, for you? My voice is clear to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, that we have developed a software. Is it a new create a software or that you have uh, found some uh, so open source software? Uh, this is my one of my uh, students' uh, work. Okay. Uh, he was the person who created this uh, software. Okay. So that uh, I think that uh, you have uh, you have a point source cloud source data set. Yes, sir. So that may you may have uh, apply some constraint, so to select some uh, some points, points from that points uh, cloud. On. Yes, sir. Okay. Because uh, when we first we thought uh, by using a drone uh, we can capture the uh, power lines also, mm -hmm. but after processing we couldn't find any uh, points. Yeah. Therefore, okay. we had to uh, draw the lines. Okay. So that uh, so that uh, you. Propose certain um, um, propose certain uh, constraint. Uh, within that constraint, you uh, check whether there are any uh, points. points so sir. when you find that points that you collaborate, that uh, those are the points that may be hindrance or that uh, may be the trees in between this. The, uh, the limitations. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, within the power line corridor, we can then uh, we can check is there any obstacles. It means uh, where we need to clear. Yeah, I I found that is very uh, very very. Uh, you presented in very uh, uh, informative manner. That is very. I think it's there is a lot of application. Uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, so that uh, another one uh, that isn't it possible um, that uh, improving uh, the um, uh, pixel rate, pixel uh, you know, size, uh, number of pixel size per particular picture. Uh, you can isn't it possible to cap uh, capture the power line? So still, uh, it means uh, we need a better resolution camera for that one, sir. Okay. Because we were used, uh, I think, uh, nearly 12 megapixel uh, camera. Uh -huh. uh, for that, uh, we can only check uh, very near to the light pole, the light, uh, the wires within, uh, with attached to the light poles. Only that part okay. we can uh, yeah. observe, yeah. but others we cannot, sir. We understand that. Uh, still, that you can improve that uh, your uh, uh, data capturing. Um, um, uh, the standard uh, make a resolution. Uh, it has to be improved, sir. So that uh, my suggestion again. Uh, so since that uh, the all the towers that um, you may have that points, no, that uh, that yes. CB may can provide uh, the the points of the power line, power yes. power post. Yes. So that still that you can point that uh, you include that point into the your uh, the, the captured data and suggest a certain area that uh, whether there are any points. Uh, certain constraint 
to capture any any points around that area isn't it possible uh so if it is a geo reference one i think uh, we can uh, collaborate with those data sir okay okay thank you very much thank you. okay thank you sir thank you uh, th it's a very good presentation a very impressive and thank you very much and thank you sir we'll move on to the next presentation by uh, mr gugan and vigneswaran from the sabarum university of sri lanka it's so it is sir Can you uh, can you please play the video? Yeah, we are working on it, madam. Is there any problem experiencing in putting the video? So sorry, sir. Uh, there is a small technical trouble. Uh, give us some time here. Yeah. Uh, just two minutes. We will start it back here. Yeah. Sorry, sir. Jan, any difficulties? Uh, shall I play the video then? Madam, we are starting it now. I graduate from the Sabarama University of Sri Lanka in the Faculty of Geomatics. I am here to present you about my research presentation under the heading of Accuracy Analysis of Short and Long Baseline with different combination of satellite constellations. So, let's move to the slide one by one. And in the introduction part, um, First, we have to see what is satellite-based position. Satellite-based position is the finding the position of the satellite receiver which is on the ground using the satellites which are on the space. For this one, finding the unknown such as X, Y, Z and the time which means the time taken from the 
for the signals from travels from satellites to the receiver we need at least four satellites for finding those four unknowns so in the world so far there are many applications using the satellite based portion such as scientific industries public safety applications surveying and geodesy atmospheric sciences with things and with the development of the modern technologies there are many countries having their own satellite systems so far this graph shows the evolution of the satellite systems from 2009 to 2021 uh, gps owned by in graph shows the gps owned by the uh, usa glonass owned by russia galileo owned by europe and compass owned by japan other than that there are many augmentation systems and the regional satellite systems available to improve the accuracy of the satellites for some regions and with the modernized uh, with the technologies uh, there are many countries they have enhanced their satellite systems with the new sig new signals and uh, the the receivers updated receivers so this graph so this table shows the how gps and glonass enhance their satellite signals with the technologies l1 l2 they have extended the band of the uh, frequency of the uh, signals with legacy signals to modernize modernize signals which to improve the accuracy and signal strength and the quality of the data and there are many factors even though there are many factors uh, affecting the satellite obser GNSS observations so far. So I have took as a research problem, I have took two major uh, factors which affects the GNSS observation. First one is satellite orbit and clock errors. Uh, due to the external gravity forces which acts on the space uh, because of some uh, celestial bodies and solar, sun, solar rays, the satellite's path of the satellite may fluctuate from its orbit. So due to these fluctuations, the uh, GNSS observations also affected its in its position. So next one is uh, clock errors. The clock errors are embedded on the atomic clock errors. Clockers are embedded on the satellites and receivers to calculate the difference time difference between the signals travels so maybe the miscalculations also cause some gn observation errors so we can eliminate not eliminate we can minimize these errors using uh, precise point positionings which gives the final products using the final products of the igs of uh, orbit products and clock products mm. And then ionosphere and troposphere errors. Uh, these are these two are the two layers which is from the, between the receiver and the satellites. So as a Sri Lanka, which is situated near the equator, always the environment of the Sri Lanka, uh, the Sri Lanka troposphere has will be the, with some heat temperature. So due to the fluctuations, uh, due to the vibration of the particles on the troposphere. The signals travels from the satellites to the receiver may be time time will be delayed. So due to this will be also there will be some uh, G observation errors. So to uh, neglect these errors I have chosen short base and long baseline observation to compare the short and long baseline with the output uh, which I have, I have selected short base and long base as the two different troposphere and as my in my objective i have selected to achieve the best satellite combination which minimize the horizontal and vertical positional errors in the short and long base applications so in the methodology i have collected two three sorry three a uh, uh, three days continuous observations from three stations and i have did precise point positioning for those three stations, I have, I have checked with the published coordinates of each stations, and I have used my precise point positioning coordinates as the reference, uh, reference coordinates. So from those coordinates, I have did the baseline adjustment for three stations using short baseline and long baselines, 
and I have did the combination of the each satellite constellations in the adjustment. So from that from that adjustment again I have choose the best satellite combination. Uh, I have choose the best satellite combination and I have again did the frequency analysis for the best combination constellation. So from these analysis and again I have checked the accuracy analysis with of the coordinates with the precise point position coordinates and I have come up with some recommendation and conclusions. So in the results and discussion part these graphs show the horizontal accuracy analysis of the short and long baseline. This orange line shows the long baseline errors with the each combination satellite constellations and the blue line shows the short base uh, positional errors horizontal errors with the company satellite combinations so for the short baseline GLONASS and Galileos give me the best output for the best output so far so it gives 7.432 millimeter difference for the GLONASS and Galileo and short baseline gives me the for the short baseline GPS GLONASS Galileo gives me the best accuracy with a 3.42 millimeter difference so as for the short baseline GPS for in the best combination GPS were not, not included because the reason was when I check the raw data there's many uh, signal droppages signal blockages for the GPS constellations and in the vertical accuracy analysis of the short and long baseline uh, for the combination of the constellations for the short baselines Galileo on Galileo constellations give me the uh, best output with 1.3 millimeter difference and as same as short baseline long baseline also uh, Galileo on sea constellations give me with the best output with 2.66 millimeter and again with the combination of the after it's done with the combination of constellations and again I have to read the frequency combinations for the best combination of satellites so for the horizontal accuracy analysis of this frequency combinations uh, both uh, modernized and legacy signals gives me the best accuracy uh, for the short and long baselines uh, with a 4.29 millimeter difference and 3.42 millimeter difference respectively for short and long baselines. Uh, in the vertical accuracy analysis, uh, the short base for the short baselines, the modernized signal give me the best uh, output with 1.14 millimeter and long baseline give me the 1.42. For the long baseline modernized signals give me the 1.42 millimeter accuracy for the vertical accuracy so as the conclusions for the short baseline positional accuracy uh, in the horizontal accuracy GLONASS and Galileo constellations gives the best accuracy and for the vertical accuracy gives the uh, Galileo constellations gives and in between those combinations of the constellations i have again as i said i have again an analyzed the frequency combinations of those best constellations so for the short baselines both modernized and legacy signals gives me the best horizontal accuracy and modernized signals only give the best vertical accuracy in the long baselines adjust when long baseline accuracy uh, the gps glonass galileo give the horizontal combination horizontal accuracy and galileo constellations give the vertical best vertical accuracy so in the frequency combination as same as the short baselines most both modernized and legacy signals gives the best horizontal accuracy and modernized signal only gives the best vertical accuracy so after my research with my understanding i can recommend it that this research work can carry it out uh, this research work carried out only using two baselines which short and long baselines in future this work could be further enhanced using multiple base station in different regions using from all over the sri lanka and it is worth to extend this study by incorporating different 
environmental conditions such as open areas, canopy as parameters. We can choose those as also one of the parameters and we can analyze those environmental conditions. And uh, the time slots also, I think that time slots also by this, when I am checking the raw data uh, with the time, there is some um, something different I have faced, I have filled with the time slots. Uh, so the time slots also plays an important role in GNSS positioning. So use the uh, best use of best time slot which minimizes the signal propagation SS is recommended to repeat this study with different environmental conditions in different region so these are some references i have chosen for my research thank you everyone for your valuable time and if you have any questions you can ask me thank you thank you thank you very much for your presentation uh, i mean since the time uh, we are uh, behind the schedule only one question can be uh, allowed if you have a question please ask Thank you. Uh, yes, shall we maybe move on to the next presentation? It will be uh, delivered by Mrs. Dinithi Ajit Singh uh, from the Southern University of Sri Lanka. So, what do you think? Dinithi? The topic of my research is an assessment of high resolution global geopotential models to fill the leveling height void for the Sri Lankan region. First, let's move to the introduction of the study. As we all know, with the beginning of satellite era, new perspective on serving and mapping began, which means we used to start global navigation satellite system GNSS widely for three dimensional positioning. As figure 1 shows, it measures ellipsoidal height above the WGS84 reference ellipsoid, which shown in simple H here, but orthometric height where measures from the joint surface are the functional heights in day to day life, which shown in capital H here. The difference between ellipsoidal height and orthometric height we all known as geoid undulation or geoid height and this geoid undulation has become necessary in converting ellipsoidal height into orthometric height as a consequence the necessity of high resolution global geopotential models have become important in not in globally only regionally and locally when focus into uh, research problem of the study Sri Lanka belongs to an area where gravity anomaly data are of poor nature due to the unavailability of a dense gravimetric network. Yet, 
global geopotential models have developed based on this data availability. Hence, suitability analysis of global geopotential models for Sri Lanka have become vital. So, according to this research problem, the research objective was to conduct an assessment of high resolution global geopotential models to fill the leveling height void in Sri Lanka. So as mentioned, the study area is Sri Lanka, which have total land of approximately 65,610 square kilometers and which locate between latitudes and longitudes as shown in here. When most of the methodology, first we selected five higher resolution global geopotential models for the study, uh, which have degree of uh, 2190. Through those global ge uh, geopotential models, joint model derived joint height was extracted. Then joint height deviation was calculated for the rest of the process. So when uh, discuss this deeply, as I mentioned, table 1 shows the selected 5 high resolution global geopotential models as EGM 2008, Agon 6C4, GECO, XGM 2019E2159, STG UGM2. So, as the first data set for the study, global geopotential model derived joint heights for 21 fundamental benchmarks were extracted respect to those selected models. So these are uh, those details have downloaded to International Center for Global Earth Models. Um, then the orthometric heights and ellipsoidal heights for the same fundamental benchmarks were taken from Sri Lanka Survey Department as the second and third data set for the study. Here, figure 3 shows the distribution of respective 21 fundamental benchmarks. So, after uh, taking all the three data sets, the observed joint undulation was calculated from the difference between ellipsoidal height and the orthometric heights as uh, shown in equation 1. Uh, then the residuals was calculated by the difference between observed joint height and the geopotential model derived joint heights as equation 2 shows. To analyze their behaviors, finally root mean square value. When most to the methodology, first we selected five higher resolution global geopotential models for the study, uh, which have degree of uh, 2190. Through those global ge uh, geopotential models, joint model derived joint height was extracted. Then joint height deviation was calculated for the rest of the process. So when uh, discuss this deeply, 
as I mentioned, table 1 shows the selected 5 high resolution global geopotential models as EGM 2008, Eigen 6C4, GECO, XGM 2019E2159, STG UGM2. So, as the first data set for the study, global geopotential model derived geoid heights for 21 fundamental benchmarks were extracted respect to those selected models. So these are uh, those details have downloaded to International Center for Global Earth Models. Um, then the orthometric heights and ellipsoidal heights for the same fundamental benchmarks were taken from Sri Lanka Survey Department as the second and third data set for the study. Here, figure 3 shows the distribution of respective 21 fundamental benchmarks. So, after uh, taking all the three data sets, the observed geoid undulation was calculated from the difference between ellipsoidal height and the orthometric heights as uh, shown in equation 1. Uh, then the residuals was calculated by the difference between observed jet height and the geopotential model derived jet heights as equation 2 shows. To analyze their behaviors, finally root mean square values were calculated uh, for the global potential models derived jet undulations. The resulted root mean square errors of geoid heights for 21 points of Sri Lanka are shown in figure 4. The values have ranged from 0 0.094 meters to 0 0.074 meters. The minimum root mean square value which is 0 0.074 meters could observe in latest high resolution global geopotential models of XGM 2019E2159 and SGG UGM2. Even so, that accuracy of the available global geopotential models are not adequate enough to use in leveling high determination or Sri Lanka. Hence, refinements for the av available GGMs that mean global geopotential models of Sri Lanka is essential to be experiment. As a consequence, the study was extended even though I have not included in this presentation. Uh, so as mentioned, considering all about resulted factors, we have extended this study to create hybrid joint model for Sri Lanka, which including topography induced, induced clustering, least square adjustment to calculate estimated residuals, and also IDW interpolation. So here figure 5b shows the resulted hybrid approach with estimated joint undulation for Aiken 6c4. So even though I have not mentioned in this presentation, the study was extended up to this extent. However, when focused back to this particular study on assessment of high resolution global geopotential models to fill the leveling height void for Sri Lankan region, the concluded factors are the minimum root mean square error value of uh, 0.074 meters could observe in latest high resolution global geopotential models of XGM 2019E2159 and SGGUGM2. Uh, also, which shows that accuracy of the available uh, global geopotential models are not adequate enough to use in leveling height determination of a Sri Lanka. It is recommended that refinements for available global geopotential models of Sri Lanka is essential to be experiment and also suggested to conduct the study with more densified data set because here we only used 21 fundamental benchmarks of Sri Lanka. So these are the references I followed through my study. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Diniti. Good afternoon, for... all of you.
taking part uh, in a very in a very interesting research because now uh, there's a high requirement in uh, there's a high requirement in developing undulation model to sri lanka so yes, thank you very much thank you. the next uh, presenter is uh, mr r k anuga aryaratna from the national aquatic resource research agency of sri lanka uh, i think it's over to mr anuga without taking uh, much time on questions thank you Good day to all of you. Here we are at to present the outcome of the study of accuracy and stability analysis of GPS aided geo augmented navigation for hydrographic survey application in Sri Lanka. Hydrographic survey mainly involves measuring depth of the water, locate the position of all navigation hazards lie on the seafloor, and a to navigation which are important to safety of navigation the main objective of hydrographic information is produce the nautical charts that's all mariners use for navigation in addition to this information is important for safe efficient and sustainable conduct of every human activities that take place in on or under the sea the positional uncertainty of this information should be comply with requirement specified in international hydrographic organization s44 standard according to the iho s44 standard hydrographic surveys can categorized as exclusive order special order order 1a order 1b and order 2 required is positional accuracy very big pain 1 meter to 20 meter It's depend on the each category. Exclusive and special order need much higher accuracy rather than order one A, one B, and order two. Here you can see GNSS methods used in hydrographic survey application, underwater construction, monitoring works, or inner harbour surveys need high positional accuracy. normally we can use arctic gnss lone base lines short base lines or ultra short base line techniques for special order order 1a and order 1b surveys use dgnss or sbas techniques for the two surveys we don't need much positional accuracy hence we can use stand alone gnss signals here you can see sbas global coverage some of them are freely available for the nss community and some of them needed annual subscription fee this is comparison of the nss correction techniques which are used for hydrography surveys if you use arctic gnss you can get millimeter or centimeter level accuracy but sbas give decimeter level accuracy rtk is little bit complicated and need base rover requirement but sbas technique is simple only needed sbas compatible receiver rtk gns have distance limitation but sbas give wider area coverage that is very important for wide rapid service rtk gns is local system but sbas is a regional system RTK GNSS do not need any subscription fee but some SBAS services needed subscription fee In this research we mainly focused on the Gagan system the airport authority of India and the Indian Space Research Organisation have 
jointly developed the Gagan as a regional satellite based augmented system. It is a system to improve the accuracy of global navigation satellite system receivers by providing the reference signal. The Gagan's goal is to provide the navigation system to assist aircraft in accurate landing over the Indian airspace and in the adjoining area to safety of life civil operation. Gagan system consists of three segments like GPS system. Our main objectives are analyze the stability and availability of Gagan SBAS service over Sri Lanka and also analyze the performance of Gagan SBAS for hydraulic survey application because Gagan SBAS technology is a new experience for GNSS users in Sri Lanka. To test the stability and availability of Gagan service, we carried out static GPS observation at Colombo and Jaffna district using T star L1 L2 receiver, access to 2B L1 Gagan compatible receiver and Garmin E-Trex consumable GPS receiver over non-control point and check the positional variation and stability variation. To check the performance of Gagan services for hydrographic service, C star L1 L2 GPS receiver and SX2 2B Gagan compatible receiver were linked to the IPAC data acquisition software and carried out the hydrographic survey using the predefined survey lines. Then analyze the positional variation. This field test were done at Norachcholai near show area. Result of the static observation clearly show accessible to be Gagan compatible receiver given low mean error and standard deviation when compared with the other two GPS receivers at any place because we done this static observation at two different places in Sri Lanka. This is the positional variation given by three GPS receivers at Jaffna district. It is clearly show SX2 to be GPS receiver given low positional variation and sparse signals are very stable and also accuracy were maintained under the one meter level. But other two receivers given high fluctuations results and stability is very low. This is the comparison of results given by 3 GPS receiver observed on control point at Kalambu district. Here also SX2 GPS receiver given good results with higher stability. This is result of kinematic survey related to Neosho hydrographic survey. Positional deviation given by two systems consists of errors due to drift, wave, wind and navigator faults. But all those factors are common for both receiver. Here also SX2 GPS receiver given best results than C star GPS receiver. This is the positional deviation of SX2 to be GPS receiver with respect to the C star GPS receiver. Here you can see positional deviation is always below the 1 meter level throughout the data acquisition time. The accuracy level is within the acceptable range for exclusive or special order hydrographic surveys according to the IHO S44 standard. So finally, we came into these conclusions. Results of the near show hydraulic survey with the Gagan augmented access blue 2B has shown the lowest positional variation than the C-Star GPS receiver. 
it's varying between 0.2 meter to 1 meter. The results of two field experiment using excess blue to be receiver with Gagan S bus service comply the IHO S44 standard for positioning, which is 1 meter for highest order hydrographic survey task. According to the system architecture, two geostationary satellites, namely PRN 127 and 128, are currently available in Gagan constellation. However, throughout the observation done in different areas of Sri Lanka, PRN 128 give stable sparse signal. It is very important to maintain the stability of the positional accuracy given by the Gagan compatible GPS receiver. Thank you very much. I think this is a very interesting research. Can everybody make a comment uh, on this research? Because uh, we know in uh, mathematics surveys, uh, the base stations are limited because we can't use base stations for far distance. So using a uh, space like open system is the real solution. So any comments on uh, this presentation? Questions? Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that uh, system uh, uh, system need to have uh, uh, that uh, uh, to get that uh, differential correction. You uh, need to give some. We have to pay, you know. Yeah. It's a, it's a bad bad size. So then uh, that uh, in this uh, research that we have compared. This uh, sex uh, blue uh, with the this uh, C star system, uh, but uh, C star system do not uh, receive this uh, correction from the C bus, no? Yeah. yeah. So so that uh, that in a static uh, situation that is okay. That uh, comparison is uh, quite obvious. But uh, is it, isn't it possible to incorporate that uh, other parameters when we are comparing this uh, uh, this uh, system stability of the system uh, in kinematic situation? Uh, yeah. Isn't it possible to incorporate some quality quality measures like uh, H drop and V drop and whatever the uh, the quality parameters? Uh, how that uh, how that affect uh, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the accuracy? Because that uh, you have run uh, uh, along a certain line, uh, that's, uh, the uh, yeah. line, and yeah. uh, you you have compared this uh, both system uh, uh, with uh, S bus and uh, without S bus that uh, S uh, that in this case. So yeah. So isn't it possible to incorporate that quality parameters for the for, for, for uh, yes it's uh, we, we can evaluate uh, these quality parameters uh, but thing is uh, uh, these parameters are common for both system especially when you consider the speed of uh, values mm -hmm. so uh, in the open sky right these are not issues so not much issues for that one. right uh, because we can uh, we can able to resume the very good uh, uh, signals and all the uh, we can uh, due to the, the open sky right? uh, the, it's not like the land survey the, yeah, we can assume that uh, that all the quality yeah. parameters are same for the both system. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So then uh, that uh, that actually it's a very good um, uh, result that we have achieved that uh, because that since we are using this uh, six bar the blue system in our surveys and in Sri Lanka in many places. So yeah. it's, a, it's a good uh, result. Okay. Thank you very much. Andrew. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll move, move on to the last presentation. Uh, I mean, uh, it will be made by uh, Mr. Jenner. Okay. 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 Okay.
and the second day we increased the height a bit and then yes extended further right so we actually used uh, two gmss receivers one is from leica and one is from trimple and this guy is a bit really old around like 17 years and this guy is young like around five or six years maybe and uh, the first result is on uh, the repeatability of satellite geometry here you can say uh, that the G15 and G29 satellites are repeating their path on each side in real day. When you compare the path of this G15 with respect to the time, you have the same kind of path as, as the, uh, the satellite geometry repeats every side in real day in, in the sense like four minutes less than a solar day. And we have used this, uh, this particular, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, the results in further analyze, right? So we, we observed for three days and uh, we checked whether the uh, same kind of results are being repeated with respect to the satellite geometry. And uh, with the satellite elevation angles, uh, you can see here, <coughs> you can see here when the satellite is at lower elevation, the error is really high when it, when it he is uh, until 50 degree, the error is really high. And when the satellite reaches to the higher orbit or the higher elevation, then the multipath error really comes down. So this is the same scenario for like day one, two, and three. Uh, this is actually for one particular satellite at one height, right? And here again, another satellite we have analyzed. So the same kind of observation we could see when the satellite is at high elevation angle, above 40 degrees, then the error is really, really low, below like six millimeters. And when the satellite comes to the low elevation angle, then the multipath error jumps up. So if you want to mitigate the multipath, you can have, uh, you can just select the satellite at higher elevation angle. And this is the result with respect to the antenna height. So at the first day, we had the antenna around like 1.6 meters. And second day on the ground, it is like 0 0.36 meters. And on third day, it was at 1.06 meters. And here you can see the, the jello plot. Here shows uh, for the day one, the multipath error on day one. So it, it was at uh, 1.65 highest uh, height we had and the multipath is really high and at the day two it's shown by pink then the multipath error is really low because it's on the ground level and when it comes to the mid range then the multipath error goes up a bit so when you when you increase the height of the receiver by by an amount then your multipath residual jump at with the L1. And uh, when, it, when we talk about the Leica GS15 and Trimple 500, actually, uh, I didn't promote these results because these Trimple uh, receivers are really old. As I said, it's like almost 17 years of age, and uh, you can't compare with the younger Leica because he's just like five years or six years, right? So here the red line shows the variation of multipath impact on Leica and the green one and the blue line shows the impact of uh, multipath on Trimple's GNSS receiver, right? So the performance of Leica was really great when it, it is compared. And to conclude, the better satellite geometry, if you have better satellite geometry and from this research, I would suggest at high elevation satellites, and uh, you can have lower instrument height. From this research, I would suggest at ground level, and you should have a good receiver combination, uh, which is like good with good calibration, a younger receiver, and with a good design, then that is a very good option as a survey to mitigate the multipath impact in a real practical surveying scenario. So rather than thinking about developing an algorithm or those, those things, then you can focus on these three things to mitigate at very basic level. But in science, 
one one man's noise is another man's signal that that's what i say is if you are surveyor or um, and a person working with lbs location based services then you don't like multi but if you are a guy who is working with remote sensing then multi path is a wow for you right because the satellite signal which are pumped onto the ground will be reflected and if you have the capability to save this reflection then there are opens up a uh, immense pathway to study further regarding soil moisture monitoring ocean surface study and there is lot and lot you can still study the uh, depth of the sea level and uh, like about the snow and those kind of things so they are open up a path with gnss reflectometry where they use the uh, multi path scenario to study further so that's it from me and uh, thank you very much for all of you uh, i am happy to answer any kind of question if you have thanks a lot thank you thank you very much for your interesting presentation are there any questions Yeah, if not, I have one question. Uh, yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> research, uh, you have considered uh, uh, the main criteria you have considered is the elevation angle and the antenna height. Now we know that multipath error behaves differently at different ground levels. At, at low ground, it is very high. At middle, maybe it's uh, maybe general. And at high ground level, multipath error is uh, high ground level with open sky, multipath error is minimal. So, have you worked on that? Have you done any research uh, taking into consideration the ground level in in uh, calculating multipath error? Yeah, uh, actually, um, I hope I am audible. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, actually, it's like this: the multipath is really low when you keep the instrument at ground level, which the even in the coast stations, we place the uh, coast antennas on ground level. That's why we mention in the coast antennas are at zero height because the PCV is at uh, like at the ground level. So we don't have any impact of the bump signal from the ground. Uh, I think uh, that should clarify. Okay, now, yeah. This error is also the amount of error also dependent on the type of antenna you if you use the choke antenna uh, yes. i mean like we use in course yes. there is minimum and there minimal are yeah types of antenna so you have taken into consideration all of all existing antennas right in this study uh, no i actually used uh, two types of types of antennas and the uh, I, I didn't mention that because uh, in simple we have one big antenna it's like 5000 Five seven double zero and another one it with low low size. So uh, even if you use a big antenna, uh, as the as the antenna was a bit old, the results was almost same. But when it comes to a chalk ring antenna, which we have been studying now, a research is going on regarding the multi path with a three D chalk ring antenna, and uh, it's actually a great one because it can mitigate any 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 ground signals, the bumped ground signal. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, one more thank thing, you, if you have time. Uh, yes. I guess, yeah, yes, so yeah, I yeah. just yeah. curious to know that the, if have you set any pre uh, cutoff angle for these all these settings? And another thing is, you know, if you compare the results in the satellite elevations, so we all yeah. know the vertical satellite will give better results than the you know lower elevation because not merely the it may be the multi part, but the other thing is the refraction, atmospheric refraction. So, how you distinguish that versus the multipath? So, I'm just, you know, want to, you yes, know. Sir. Yeah. Um, during the methodology, uh, we actually compared uh, both the uh, P1, sorry, L1 and L2. And using the algorithm, we actually uh, differentiated the atmospheric, all the atmospheric errors. Like, like, we actually did it in the ground because we wanted to eliminate the other combination of errors. And uh, using the dual frequency observation, we actually uh, distributed uh, the other atmospheric interactions. And uh, actually, uh, for the clock correction, we have used the PTP corrections. And after that only, we got the multipath combination uh, into into calculation. Okay, thank you.
Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. If there are no any other questions, we can, uh, I think, wind up the session. We have now come to the end of this session. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, I sir. Think, thanks. Uh, six, uh, six, Six uh, presenters made their interesting presentations. And I am very happy to say that uh, most of the presentations are in the area of, are in the areas where we have a burning, I mean, issues. Because there are still gaps to be filled uh, in, uh, in actually in uh, physical geodesy and as well as in uh, survey. Like, uh, you know, the GNSS technology is advancing very fast. And most of the researchers have undertaken research in this area. So it is really interesting that in future, we can come out with very uh, good uh, solutions to mitigate the inferences or the problems uh, we encounter in GNSS technology. With that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Savargun University for giving me this opportunity to chair this uh, first session of the second international symposium and I wish uh, I wish all the best uh, in the coming sessions. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you Dr. Brian Rukusinga, uh, the chair uh, for the session today. Uh, actually putting the final remarks of this session uh, on behalf of the conference team, uh, I now wish to express my sincere gratitude uh, for the chair of this technical session today, uh, Dr. Brian Rupasinghe, uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, continuing the session very smoothly. Uh, and also the, again, uh, the plen uh, plenary speech, uh, Professor Wu Chen uh, from the Polytechnic University, Hong Kong, uh, for sharing uh, valuable thoughts with us uh, and also Dr. H. M. I. Prasanna, Chair, Josim uh, 2022, uh, and also the panel of judges and uh, all the uh, presenters and participants of the event today uh, for gracing the event uh, with their invaluable uh, presence. Okay, have a good day for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.
uh, dear fellow participants of the 2022 GeoSIM International Conference, it's my pleasure uh, to participate in this event. I am Conrad Tang, a land surveyor working in Hong Kong. And it happens that my institute, professional institute, the Hong Kong Institute of Surveyors, got a funding from our government uh, in the promotion along uh, of our professional surveys and liaison with the profession, land surveying professionals along the Belt and Road countries. Sri Lanka is one of the important countries in this belt. Okay, and rather a little bit uh, unfortunate, well, uh, due to this COVID-19 and then our, our personal visit plan was delayed. Okay, so at least we can fulfill some communication programs. Here, I'm asked to introduce the land administration system in Hong Kong. And my PowerPoint here mentioned also Kadasta. Well, I think this is not the key point, so I would concentrate on public administration in this 15 minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> seeing this chart in the early 2000s, that the, our government had a planning and lands bureau, okay, on top. And then this is a policy bureau and then under him there are functional departments buildings lands planning land registry and related uh, engineering departments so this is early 2000s and then uh, we have 2014 we have the sec and two uh, deputy sec and 2016, you can see there's a little bit increase of personnel. Uh, and then 17, and then now 2022, we have a big, <laughs> uh, 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 the policy department becomes bigger than ever. Okay, so uh, you, it gives an impression that the Hong Kong government would tend to do more policy administration in the near future. And to introduce how the land controls are done in Hong Kong, uh, it's done, say, the responsible government departments, okay? These are the action departments, okay? Four of them, planning, buildings, lands, and EPD, environmental. Okay, so their functions, uh, planning departments control the legal use of land. So it's a very powerful department, okay? They can decide whether your land worth nothing, say, or, or just growing trees and grass, or you can use your land to, to, to construct buildings. So it's the planning department. And then buildings department control the, the structure of the building, okay, engineering. Uh, the lands department control the lease of the land and then environments. And in this planning control, the is the most important tools is the OZP, Outline Zoning Plan. So you can imagine that district by district, it controls the legal use of that small area. Okay, very detailed planning. Okay. And then it's done under two laws. Okay, so Town Planning Ordinance and Town Planning Amendment Ordinance. Okay, so in Hong Kong, the government departments 
would be powerful if they control or they handle they handle more ordinance law okay that's law or x <clears throat> and in recent year is the trend that town planning board uh, resumed surplus industrial land to business and residential so hong kong is a say an international city uh, the real estate property is very expensive uh, but you see that this place had not, not much industrial land use of course the main industrial developments are done in the pearl river delta guangdong area okay the hinterland of hong kong so hong kong serves as a business center okay and in that land control action um, uh, in the lands department they control lease okay government lease ordinance and that that law provide them with power to administer the land because a lease would record the original intention of land use but uh, unfortunately this is a uh, rather primitive system uh, this registration i think experts would know but well this is hong kong we we use the british system for a long long time and our government had no intention to amend that okay i would say so although we have a titles ordinance in place but has not yet implemented for 20 years uh, building control for buildings department <clears throat> Then, well, if you want to be, uh, uh, construct a building, you need to hire an architect, submit building plans, and then the department would approve the plan according to their rules, okay? To the safety, uh, use, and things like that. And in building control recently, our lands department take frequent actions to demolish existing residential structure on the previous agricultural land. Well, Hong Kong a city, you have agricultural land, yes, in the new territories, okay? The uh, less developed area. <coughs> and then EPD, well, it's a relatively new department as the environmental protection concepts come into place in the 2000s. So they would touch the issue of air quality, uh, conservation of country parks, noise control, uh, uh, waste management, and, and so on. And then this is a uh, topic market-led approach in land administration well <coughs> that's what we believe in the past two decades and it was declared by the then chief executive okay saying that the hong kong government has implemented a market-led approach so it sounds um, more you have more freedom Okay, let the market control or says. Uh, well, then there are there are uh, famous uh, surveyors, uh, Enemark, and compare this market led and the government led the development approach. Okay, and I I just add this, I would say that our Hong Kong government would still implement market-led but more or less government controlled market-led <laughs> so well this is the approach in uk but in recent years uh, hong kong has well we would not 
have very good relationship with UK. And then, so this market-led approach has not been in fashion. Um, anyway, so-called market-led management, that means let the private sector to obtain available vacant land parcels for development. So the government had a, a few methods of selling land, okay, by auction, by tender, by private treaty grant, and by application. And then this red color word means uh, the government has stopped this uh, issue, has stopped this action. It was 2013 that government cancels the uh, land application issue. Okay. For land application means the government had a pool of available land and let the developers to pick the, the piece that they think it would be suitable for development. Okay. Uh, it sounds a, it's a good and free uh, mechanism, but the government had uh, canceled that. And in our lands department, to control land through lease control. And then if, well, in this registration system, you may have a deed that was registered a long, long time ago. Well, as early as 1841. <laughs> and then, well, at the time, maybe uh, it's just different use. And then you want to change the use. So it would be a lease modification. That procedure would be needed. Okay, I'm not saying it would be easy, but that's the proper procedure a land developer would do. Okay, uh, either change the conditions in the lease or land exchange, surrender a piece of old land, irregular boundaries, and then we want a new piece of land with new functions and new boundary, formal rectangular lot. Okay. So, and why lease? Well, the government has made premium. Okay, the the <coughs> developer had to pay well very dearly land price for the development, okay, it's called premium. And usually the, the time now, well, we, we all know 1997. So the Hong Kong government would grant a land starting from 1997 for 50 years to 2047, okay. And then for that type of land, 3% of the weightable value would be added, okay? So, or would be added on the original land tax. Uh, for weightable value, that means uh, is the market use value of that property, okay? So, uh, well, it, it's a fair concept, okay? It's a residential unit, you pay more. It's, if it's just a agricultural land, maybe I don't, maybe the government would not be interested. Um, so there are other developments, uh, other departments would assist the development of our society. Okay, transport department, housing department, and then it's and then under a bureau. So this transport and housing bureau would control several departments. And then new organization came up. And as one may uh, notice that the city of Hong Kong had also a problem of, of getting old. That means you don't have new buildings very much. 
as comparing with the other side of, of Hong Kong, the Samjan. Wow, all new buildings. Okay, so is, is that the residents there had been living in all residential units for sometimes over 30, 40, 50 years. Then the government formed a urban renewal of authority, try to renew the old land. Okay, that means government buy the old flats and build new flats. Okay, so, well, that would be a good intention, but for implementation, there are difficulties. Uh, <clears throat> And there are many uh, reviews and uh, urban renewal re review. I'm not going into that. And anyway, uh, as one step here, 5,000 buildings was over 50 years in that 2013. So rapid aging of our urban area. <coughs> so even there's a new law to handle this urban renewal. And then you have redevelopment and rehabilitation. That means uh, for redevelopment, they buy the old flats, demolish it and build new buildings. Whereas the rehab, that means for maintenance, okay? Help the old, uh, say the poor landowners to, to do the, house the building unit maintenance that would be expensive so it's a, also a good policy and then there, there's another improvement in the urban redevelopment so private developers would buy land parcels and then redevelop sometimes on the land parcels there are different residential units so in 2010 is eight if you can get 80 percent of that building the ownership of that building threshold then you can forcefully okay redevelop that means still you you, you need to pay a so-called fair market compensation uh, even though the less the less the minority 20% would not agree to sell the land. <clears throat> and just this year, you're still 80% ownership of development side. It is, wow, <laughs> development side. That means if you develop a large piece, like four or five buildings, and then you have uh, a high percentage control of other buildings, and then in one building, you only have 60, 70, 60, and then it count as a unit. So, well, the law has further improved to help the redevelopments, I would say. Okay, whether it's fair, it's always arguable. And then is, there's an important land you, uh, you, you need, at the land registration, the land registry, because we mentioned that we use this so uh, although it's voluntary, but uh, it would be unthinkable that a landowner would not register the, the property, okay? So uh, the land registry is confident that, well, 100% of that had been registered. Maybe a very small percentage had other registration problems that say, uh, uh, that registration deeds had some uh, misinformation or something like that. <clears throat> and this law has been the longest, earliest piece of law exercised in Hong Kong it, since 1844. Well, you would imagine that in 1844, that was the most advanced in the well, the, the re property registration. But after 160 years, uh, 80 years, oh my God. <coughs> but, my, but our government had no, 
had no immediate interest in improving the registration system. Okay. Uh, so I don't want to say about this uh, primitive law is that for document that can be registered, any map, plan, this film, whatever. And there's no control, no quality control of the map. So whether the map is wrong is your problem. Okay, so this is not an updated international law. And here is about the uh, Kadasta. So I will skip about that concept. And uh, well, anyway, <coughs> Kadasta means a record of land interest. In fact, a government anywhere would have records of land interest. Okay, be it or be it, it's not called a Kadasta. So uh, in the, and then international, in international societies in the 1980s, and then we is popular to use the term multi-purpose cadastre, okay? And then in the 90s, and then computer came out, land information system came out, and then in 2000s, GIS, okay? GIS means besides land, you also handle uh, data of population. And then 2010, spatial data infrastructure. And now we, the favorable terms is 3D cities using GIS, uh, open GIS and then BIM, okay, to do the, well, detailed information recording. And then maybe it would be used later to, to represent legal interest. Anyway, it's the data. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not saying more about the uh, the cadastre, and well, in in Hong Kong, uh, these are the departments handling land, okay, land registry, planning, uh, survey and mapping office under lands department, the land administration office for lease control. Uh, rating and valuation department to for helping the government to collect tax, land tax, and then the buildings department to control the technical standard of the building. And well, a short introduction of our tax, land tax. Uh, well, in the lease, well, maybe that lease was signed in 1844. Then usually you would have pay an annual rent of $1, $2, okay? <laughs> that cannot be changed. <laughs> but for reason, but for reason, uh, land, at least it would be more expensive, okay? And then raise, rent and then raise. Raise is a land use tax, as I mentioned, okay? The, the rating and valuation department control and updates this database. And then after 1997, uh, the government uh, issued another new tax. Okay, it's called government rent. So 3% after 1997. Uh, <clears throat> and also other statutory corporations helping the government to manage land, say for our housing authority, okay, they help the government to build public housing. Uh, MTR, uh, the, this is a large corporation that to build underground railway, okay, and so on. Okay, so that would be uh, the introduction of, uh, I think it's 15 minutes already. Uh, oh, <laughs> I just came across uh, a, my, my, uh, a, an application, uh, you would, I just, try to show you the power of planning ordinance. So this is the planning ordinance function. They will decide usually uh, beforehand, uh, this is uh, uh, open space, open use. Suddenly you have a GIC, uh, got other government institute uh, land that you can build buildings. So why, 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 why this, these two? and not others, okay? Then this is the, 
uh, professional efforts, I would say in Hong Kong. Okay, because uh, different song name, I, well, simply either you can grow trees or you can grow buildings. So the, the value will be different, right? So for this piece of land, the landowner has bought it at several years ago, 200 Hong Kong dollars per, per square foot. Uh, so six million Hong Kong dollars, okay, for that piece of land. But after applying a planning change and then change to this GIC, and then town planning board has approved that. Uh, well, the value of land is, um, how many? 128 million Hong Kong dollars. So the profit was about 20 times. So that's why developers is a good job in Hong Kong and they hire a lot of professionals. Okay, that ends my, my talk here. This is my sharing. Thank you very much.